Welcome to the Hingham Board of Selectmen meeting for Tuesday evening, January 30th, 2018. Um, we're actually coming to you from the uh, second floor, and that's because later in the evening, we will be joined by uh, Hingham's Advisory Committee and our Community Preservation Committee, who will be uh, preparing and reviewing their recommendations for community preservation funding for the next fiscal year. Um, prior to that, uh, we do not have any minutes for approval. Uh, any public comment on items not on the agenda? Okay. If not, uh, for, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we will be conducting three interviews for police patrolman positions. Uh, we have three candidates. Each candidate will come in individually. Um, the board will have an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, the board will take up the appointment of, uh, of the patrolman at our meeting next week. Um, so, Chief and Deputy Chief, you're ready to go? Yes. Okay, could you, um, could you ask Mr. Campanelli to come in, please? Thanks for coming in. Very nice Welcome, Mary Power. Nice to meet you. Welcome. Very nice to meet you. How are you, sir? Paul Healy. Very nice to meet you, sir. Very nice to meet you. Mr. Kimmel, if you want to take a seat right over there. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for coming in this evening. Thank you for having me. Um, so this evening, what we're going to do, we're going to take, you know, 10, 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, the way we'd like to structure this interview is give you an opportunity first to introduce yourself to the board, tell us a little bit about you and your interest in the position, Okay. And then uh, each one of the three of us will ask you a couple of questions. And then at the very end, we'll give you the opportunity to either ask us any questions that you have or make any additional points that uh, you want to make sure the board is aware of. So okay. that's Thank kind you. of the, the sequence for this evening. If you could start and tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Uh, good evening. My name is Derek Campanelli. Uh, I was born and raised right next door in Lowell, Massachusetts. Um, I grew up there, um, went to high school there, graduated in 2006. Uh, from that point, I went over to Roger Williams University down in Rhode Island and studied criminal justice. I earned a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in criminal justice. Uh, while I was in school there, I did a few internships, one with the Barnstable County Police Department uh, and also one for the uh, Massachusetts State Police Underwater Recovery Unit and Marine Section. Um, after completing uh, my degrees at Roger Williams, I moved back to Norwell and uh, worked as a front desk clerk for the police station there. Um, after about a year or so doing that, I ended up uh, taking a full-time police officer position with the county of Maui out in Hawaii attended a nine-month um, intensive police academy out there. I uh, was on the road for a few months and just about at the year mark of moving out there, um, I realized that I miss home, so I ended up coming back and I moved to Hingham. Uh, from that point, I uh, went and attended a police academy at the Plymouth Reserve Academy down in Plymouth. And uh, from that point, I've been working as a special police officer for the town of Noel and also as a front desk clerk for the police station there. And um, I've pretty much been around Hingham all my life. Um, I'm huge into Revolutionary War reenacting, so you may have seen me um, marching by on the 4th of July parade dressed as a red coat reenactor. And um, that's pretty much my story. Thank you. Thank you. On a, on, a, on a day like today, you must miss Hawaii just a little, just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> um, Paul, maybe you'd like to start with a question or two. Uh, sure, um, Mr. Campanella, your your accomplishments, um, in my opinion, are impressive. I notice you also hold a pilot's license. Uh, yes, sir, that is correct. Uh, what kind of what kind of plane are you licensed to fly? Um, I'm licensed in um, mostly small single engine aircraft from uh, Cessnas to um, Piper Warriors and Piper Archers. Um, I have about, I think, uh, 140 um, pilot and command hours of those types of aircraft. And that was something that I um, worked on while I was at school to 
try to broaden my horizons a little bit and try to teach me about communication skills and multitasking and being able to um, talk to air traffic control and uh, fly a plane and do everything all at once. So I think that helped a little bit. Um, did you complete the nine-month academy that you referenced in Hawaii? Uh, yes, sir, I did. All right. And, and did you do any uh, street work out there while you I, were in I, the academy? I or? completed um, two full months of the FTO program out there. There was um, another two phases that I was um, in the process of completing. But at that point, I had realized that um, I miss Massachusetts a lot. I miss the community. Um, being 13 hours by flight from uh, my family and friends and everything that I knew, it, it just kind of came down a little heavy on me. And I realized that I still wanted to be a police officer, but I didn't want to um, continue the career out there in Hawaii. Do you have police officers in your family? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Who would that be? My, um, my uncle is a re uh, retired lieutenant with the state police. My older brother is a, um, was a homicide detective down in Florida for 10 years, and he's currently with the FBI task force out of Miami, Florida. Um, my twin brother is also a special police officer for the town of Noel for a number of years. Parents must be proud. Uh, yes, sir. Um, do you have an opinion, or do you, do you hold one with respect to the most significant battle of the revolution in the uh, southern parts of uh, the country? Uh, do I personally hold the yeah. opinion? Yeah. Um, I know that I believe it was the Battle of Yorktown when they surrendered. Uh, the sword was pre presented to a Hingham resident That's a good by answer. the name of Lincoln. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Last question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very well done. Uh, I would concur with my uh, with my colleague, Mr. Healy, that you have a very impressive resume, Mr. Campanelli. And uh, I, I just have a couple questions for you. Sure. Uh, I was particularly impressed with your educational background. You shared a little bit about uh, about that with uh, with all of us and with the public tonight. I'm just wondering, um, in terms of your education, how do you think that that's helped shape you as a candidate now for a police officer job in Hingham? Um, the thing about my resume that I think has helped quite a bit was I've gained a lot of experience with a lot of different departments from um, county police agencies like the Barnesville County Police Department with a small town of Norwell that I'm very familiar with and then um, with a large city department like that out in Maui, wow. Hawaii. Yeah. I kind of can take all those experiences and then add the state police experience and kind of narrowed it down to, I, I want something bigger than Norwell, but um, not too big. Something that can still be a, a small community, a community where you can know everyone by name, where you can see the same faces over and over again. Kind of like a community that you'd almost see in a Norman Rockwell um, painting or illustration. Um, that's the type of police officer that I want to be, is one that knows the community and is deeply tied with the community, um, rather than one that you never see the same people twice. But then at the same time, that the department's not too small, that there's no room for um, moving up and later on in years. Right. And I, I feel like, you know, your decision to move back, your, your answer just now, it, it, it seems like you place a, a high value on the community around you. And I think that is a value shared by the, the Hingham Police Department. You know, unfortunately, the Hingham Police Department sees um, not only the Norman Rockwell uh, uh, tableau at Hingham in the Square, but, you know, a lot of other stuff going on, not only in Hingham, but around the South Shore. And, uh, you know, that's why I think we're so thorough in our hiring process because you play a pivotal role in terms of developing community trust, um, I think, in, in the department and in its officers, but also in enforcing the laws. And it's, it's sort of a tough balance. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how, how, you, how you would pursue that balance. Um, that, that is a tough balance, but um, I believe the best way about going about that would be um, the aspect of community policing and being able to take a proactive 
approach to policing. So um, with community policing, instead of just being completely reactive to everything that happens with the town, with the residents, you can kind of educate people and you can tie the community into the police department. So um, that way, when police officers come to the residence of some home, you're more familiar and able to help the police officer. Then at the same time, you're going to be eliminating some of the uh, calls for service, hopefully, and um, reducing, hopefully, fatalities from automobile accidents with um, programs like the designated driver program or um, the uh, Save by the Belt program where you encourage people to be wearing seat belts and you teach them about that and that's going to cut down quite a bit too. Great. Um, and one, one final question um, and you, you touched on, on this a little bit in your discussion with Paul but you know again uh, the other thing that jumps out about your resume I think is the number of sort of different experiences that you've had, the, the kind of hobbies that you've pursued and I'm wondering if you can either pull from one of those experiences or think about a challenge that you may have encountered in your life that you have overcome um, that again sort of shape you as a person to be a police officer in Hingham. Um, uh, one thing that comes to mind for some reason when you ask that question is uh, one of my thoughts of the patrol shifts out in Hawaii uh, one day when uh, we got into the cruiser, my FTO and myself, and uh, we started our shift and just um, all of a sudden we realized that there was a spider about the size of my <laughs> hand that was on the front windshield of the cruiser. So we both jumped out of the cruiser, we put it in the park and we <laughs> jumped out and uh, the, the spiders out there, they're not only big but they're poisonous. So um, if they bite you, your um, feet, your hands will swell up, you won't even know it until you notice um, the injury. But um, so we jumped out of the cruiser and we're looking, trying to figure out what to do and all of a sudden the spider from the middle of the dashboard just goes down in between the two seats between myself and the FTO. So we're, we're standing there totally bewildered what to do and then all of a sudden the um, police radio started going off and we realized that even though we had this big dilemma and we're both terrified of spiders that the job still goes on and if that radio is going and someone needs a cruiser for uh, some sort of call for service, we both got back in that cruiser and for the rest of the night we were <laughs> driving around with our feet and hands in the air. But um, you know, just thinking about that, it, it kind of amplifies that um, when you're there to do the job, you're there to do the job and no matter what happens while you're there, um, you, you're going to get the job done. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I just have one final question because um, I think uh, You've touched on a number of, of different things and uh, my question is as you think about a Hingham police officer and you think about the qualities that that would be important to be a successful police officer here in Hingham, what, what qualities jump to mind? Um, I, I would say honesty, um, compassion and being humble. Is, um, every person that you deal with you, you need to bring all three of those to the table. And um, even though you're wearing a police officer uniform, and, uh, that may make you feel a little bit more brave and different. You got to remember that every person you're dealing with, they could be a veteran, they, they could be even braver than you, they could be a doctor, a, a really influential um, school educator, and you just need to bring that humility to every call that you go to. And even though you're wearing the police officer uniform, you've got to treat everyone with utmost respect and dignity. And the honesty? Um, that, that's completely probably one of the most um, fundamental parts of being a police officer is your honesty and integrity. Is, um, without that, there's no trust. And without respect, um, every call you go to, you're going to be your own worst enemy. And you're going to be... Um, creating problems rather than solving problems. Right. Um, Mr. Campanelli, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, we will, uh, the board is, uh, we're conducting the interviews this evening and then next week we will be um, putting this back on the agenda to make, uh, to make decisions. So again, we so appreciate your coming in this today. Thank you for having thank me. You. Thank you. Thank you.
And so uh, our next candidate is Mr. Benjamin Carr. Welcome, Mr. Carr. I'm Karen Johnson. Mary Power, welcome. Mr. Carr, you know Would you like to take a seat right over there? Uh, Mr. Carr, thank you for coming in this evening. Um, we're going to take about 10 or 15 minutes. We're going to ask you to, uh, if you could, please lead off by introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about your background, uh, telling us about why you're interested in becoming a police officer in the town of Hingham, uh, and then each of us will take turns asking one or two questions, and then at the conclusion we'll give you an opportunity to ask any questions or make any any final remarks that you'd uh, that you'd like to. So with that, I'll turn it to you for an introduction, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ben Carr. I grew up in the town of Hingham. I graduated Hingham High School in 2007. I went on to Stonehill College, where I graduated in two, sorry, I graduated, yeah, graduated in 2011 from Stonehill. Um, I majored in religious studies and history. Uh, since then, I have worked in higher education. Uh, I did that for three years at Curry College uh, as an admissions counselor. Um, probably my favorite position that I've held thus far in my career. Um, but I've also had the opportunity to work in sales as well as working in advertising and software at the moment. Um, the biggest reason why I would like to be a Hingham police officer is I've always tried to find the things in a career that enable me to have some sense of fulfillment when I go home. Um, and I can't think of a better place to be a police officer than the town I grew up in, um, a town that basically helped raise me. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a very close-knit neighborhood, so to have the opportunity to be a police officer in Hingham and give back to the town and give back to the people who looked after me when I was growing up would be uh, an honor, for sure. Thank you. Um, Karen, would you like to start with a question or two for Mr. Carr? Uh, sure, Mr. Carr, you know, very, very impressive uh, resume, really impressive work experience. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about uh, your educational experience and how that may help uh, shape you as a candidate um, between Hingham High and, and Stonehill College. Sort of what, what about your education do you bring to the table as a Hingham police officer? Um, it's actually a really relevant question for me. I've been reflecting a lot recently, having gone through the process, and when I went to Hingham High School to pick up my transcript, I asked the um, woman who worked at the desk if I could visit one of my old teachers. Um, and this teacher had taken me to Ireland when I was a senior in college, uh, sorry, senior in high school. Um, and that had really kind of kicked off this travel bug with me, um, which later led me to studying in Ireland and then feeling comfortable enough to take a risk in having lived abroad. Um, but I definitely was shaped by Hingham High School a lot, and I was very grateful for that. And I was felt lucky enough that I was able to connect with her to tell her how much of an impact that she had for me. Um, you know, Hingham High School was, uh, it gets a lot of credit. Having worked in higher education, I've compared it to other schools as part of my job. And I do feel that the, the high school prepared me very well. I felt like I was a step ahead once I got to college. Um, and particularly with that abroad experience, not in high school, not quite being on my own, but with a group and having that sense of independence. Um, I felt much more comfortable once I got to college and was able to challenge myself in more public speaking roles, uh, whether it was a tour guide or um, working rec sports games or even um, as an official for NCAA volleyball matches. Um, I was pretty comfortable standing in front of people, making a decision, feeling confident in my decisions. Um, and I attribute a lot of that to my sort of grooming through Hingham High School. That's fantastic. And, you know, good for you for taking the opportunity to, to seek out your teacher and say thank you. I, I, feel like, I feel like it's sometimes easier not to, not to go to that trouble. And I can only imagine how that faculty member felt when, uh, when they saw you, first of all, as a grown-up guy, second of all, you know, coming in to say thank you. I think that's a, a tremendous gesture. Um, and sort of jumping off from there, um, y you know, as you considered this position, um, you know, the, the role of a police officer in Hingham is important not only for law enforcement but to the community as a whole. And I wonder if you've thought about kind of the role of community policing as you've considered this job. I have, absolutely. Um, working as an admissions counselor, a big part of my role was actually in 
sort of helping to develop the community at the college so that students would feel more comfortable. Um, I sat on the diversity committee uh, as the admissions office representative and we would do different programs to you know help students feel more comfortable students who were um, we refer to them as multicultural students other colleges call them Alana um, but in order to create that greater sense of community really make it feel a home um, as a police officer I know it is very important to you know really be a face be someone that the public can see you as get to know you um, so that way if anything's happening they feel comfortable calling you um, flagging you down or even if it's something that they're just thinking hey there's something going on can I talk to you about it um, building that trust within the community is obviously something that I would strive for um, and is obviously very important as well great uh, and one last question is um, you know again looking at some of your experiences your your work experience your experience uh, living in Australia um, I'm wondering if there's something in your professional experience or in a challenge that you may have encountered and overcome that you think adds a dimension to your candidacy as, uh, as a Hingham police officer? I think my current role would probably have the most challenges. Um, I came into my current company uh, at a very, very much a transitional period. So helping that company develop different procedures and operational processes or processes um, in order to make the workflow run smoother, be more effective, more efficient, um, and ultimately more profitable. That's really been the biggest challenge is establishing those processes and, and making them work and also documenting them as well. Great, thank you. Cool. Mr. Carr, good evening. How are you? Good, how are you? I'm all right. You say you went to school in Ireland for a period? I did, yes. Uh, I went to National University of Ireland in Galway for about four months. Nice. Um, tell me, sir, uh, when you served as an, as an admissions counselor at Curry College, uh, what were the qualities that you looked for in, in, in students, and do you see any parallels in your own candidacy uh, for the position of police officer here in Angham? Uh, yes, I absolutely do see parallels. One of the biggest things I looked for in a student, um, working at Curry, it was a different student population that we attracted than this than Stonehill where I went. Um, we were getting students who had struggled in high school oftentimes. Uh, we had a very strong support program for students with language-based learning style differences. So a lot of those students hadn't had the support that they really needed in order to succeed in high school. Um, and we found a lot of those students would do very well once they got that support structure and actually learned how they learned best. So for me, a big thing was whether or not a student was hardworking, um, you know, if a student was excited about the opportunity to go to college or if they felt like they were just going through the motions because that's what they were expected of them. Um, and also I wanted to see students who would improve throughout their high school career and obviously someone who's involved as well. Um, someone who's going to really add to that community. I've always been a hard worker. Um, I don't know if you folks have my resume. Um, I think I've had two jobs consistently since 2012. Um, I've worked consistently since I was 16. Um, and, you know, I've always been someone who's strived to improve no matter what I've done. Um, whether it was working in a pizza place when I was in high school, learning all the different roles within that, that restaurant, um, from just cleaning, being a, a server, working in the kitchen, to doing inventory, um, all the things that then led me to eventually run that restaurant. Um, so I do think that I guess selfishly looked for students who had similar qualities to myself because I felt like I had done well in life and I knew the students had those qualities they would also do well. One last question, sir. Um, I noticed from your uh, application that you, you majored in religious studies. So I want to pose a question to you. Sure. Um, at West Point, there's a uh, there's a monument of sort with, with the inscription, a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, or tolerate those who do. As a police officer in the town of Hingham, what would your code of conduct be? Um, it would absolutely be very strict. Um, I'm not somebody who has ever compromised my own morals. I always stick by them um, in high school or college if it came to you know, underage drinking or whatever that case may be. Um, I had opportunities 
I stuck with what I felt was right, and I would do the same as a police officer, without question. Thank you. I know. You should good, go first. Good questions. Um, two, two questions for you, Mr. Carter. First, you know, as someone who's grown up in this town and, you know, you've had professional experience in different places, but as you think about the police department right now in Hingham, what sort of challenges or issues are we facing as a, as a community? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure I have a great answer for that one, to be perfectly so as, honest. So as you think about some of the issues that the police officers face and what might make a police job challenging, what, what sorts of things come to mind? Because I think, you know, when, when you were growing up in Hingham, um, yeah. you know, we've, we've been here 17 years and it, it feels like it's changed. And you've yes. experienced Hingham, you know, as a child. So as, as you think about being a police officer, what... I, I do actually have an answer for that tackling? one now that I think about that. Um, I think it's just, it's a much more public um, image that police officers have. And, you know, with social media and everybody pulling out their phones at every instant, I think officers do have to hold themselves to a higher standard mm -hmm. um, and really rely on those morals in order to, you know, maintain that, maintain being a trustworthy figure in the town and someone people can rely on rather than seeing as somebody who's just out to get them, um, which also then goes back to community policing and, and being a part and being present um, and just being involved. But I think making sure that you're not, that you stay in line, you stick to your, your morals, you stick to your code um, in an era where, yeah, people are not hesitant to pull out their phone and wait for you to do something wrong. Sure, thank you. And um, my final question is, um, uh, obviously from your work experience, you're someone who takes on a challenge, you work pretty hard at it. Um, you know, how would, what aspirations would you have on, you know, coming into the police department in terms of your development as a member of, of our law enforcement team? My goal would just be to be um, as productive as a member of the force as possible. Um, however that leads me in a career path is, is however that turns out. Um, but certainly always striving to be a better police officer, take advantage of training opportunities, um, and just never stop learning. Um, Thank you. Um, and uh, just before we, uh, before we conclude, do you have any questions for us or is there anything in you know the course of our conversation that that you wanted to mention? Um, no, I'm just very grateful for the opportunity to be here tonight and just wanted to thank you very much. Well, we appreciate it as well. So we thank you and next week the board will be um, making, uh, making decisions. So again, we appreciate your coming in this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And our final candidate this evening is Mr. John Thomas. Mr. Thomas, welcome. Mr. Thomas, Karen Johnson. Mary Power, nice to meet you. How are you? Paul Healy. Oh, thank you so much. That's great. We'll That's fine. Thank you. thank you. If you'd like to sit right over there, thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas, what we'd like to do will take about 10 or 15 minutes. We'll start by asking you to just please introduce yourself to the board. Um, tell us a little bit about, about you, about your experience, about why you're interested in becoming a police officer for the town of Hingham. Then we'll each take turns asking one or two questions. And at the conclusion, if you have any questions for us or anything else that you'd like to add. So uh, if I may, please, could you just tell us a little about yourself and why you'd like to be a Hingham police officer? For those of you who don't know me, I'm John Thomas, and I'm born and raised here in Hingham. And I went through Hingham Public Schools, graduated from Hingham High School. After that, I did a year of college at Dean College in Franklin, Mass. Um, I then immediately started working for my father's company right in town. And that's when I started working closely with Hingham Police Department. And I have family and family friends in the police community, so it's kind of why I'm into it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Paul, would you like to start? Um, sure. Yeah. Can I call you John? Yeah, for sure. Hey, 
I've known your father for a number of years. Uh, tell me something, John. What do you think your experience working with the police um, has done in terms of insights into the police world or the police mission? I'm talking about here in Hingham, obviously. Yeah. Um, I think that um, it brought me to a lot of situations where you have to work quick and you see a lot of things that a lot of people don't see. And it just makes you a well-rounded, hard-working person, I think. And, yeah. Um, what do you think about the, the concept of living in the community that you police? I think it's wonderful to be able to, if I did get the job, to be able to give back to your community that has made you into the person you are. In, in terms of the qualities of, of a good police officer, whether it's here in Hingham or, or anywhere where someone puts on a uniform with a badge and a gun, um, what are the three non-negotiable qualities that somebody who's a police officer, in your opinion, has to have? In my opinion, I would say compassion, integrity, and leadership. Where's truthfulness and all of that? What? Where's truthfulness and all of that? Is that integrity wrapped in there? Integrity. Okay. Thank you. I'm gonna, um, just a couple things I noticed, and thank you for this resume because it contains, I think, some additional information. Um, I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the work that you did at the Cardinal Cushing School in Hanover. Um, so I worked with the handicap and the special needs there for community service for high school. Mm -hmm. And I worked closely with the older group. And you got to see a lot of things you don't see and work with people that you don't work with all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was good to work with people that are unfortunate. And, and just, you know, as you think about some of the experiences that you had there, um, and you think about becoming a, a Hingham police officer, are there, you know, are there things that you gained from doing that that you think might help you be an effective police officer? Yeah, definitely. Um, don't take everything for granted, and you also don't know what people are going through or struggling with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, if, uh, you know, in your experience, so, you know, one of the things that strikes me as, as I've uh, had the opportunity to interact with the police officers, I get a really good appreciation for the fact that a police officer has to make a very quick assessment of a situation and a very quick decision. And in a lot of cases, you don't have the time or the opportunity to ask somebody what to do or to run it by somebody, which I've really come to understand and appreciate is um, is pretty challenging, um, but in in your work experience, you you know you experience that to some degree as well. I just wondered if there was you know an experience or something in you know your your professional background where you know you had to make a quick decision or a quick assessment um, on your own that might just kind of give us a little bit of a preview as to what you might do if you, if you had that circumstance happen as a police officer. D does a story come to mind or an experience? Yeah, uh, well, every day. Every day I deal with car accidents and all sorts of types of accidents. And you have to be quick with your thought and you have to be able to plan well. Mm -hmm. And you have to be efficient. Mm -hmm. and that's really it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Karen? Yeah, I guess following up on Mary's question, um, you know, the, one of the things I guess I, I saw when I did, I, I noticed in your resume you did the Citizens Police Academy. Mm -hmm. I, I participated in that a, a fall or two ago. And one of the things that struck me, particularly about the, the sort of accident scene um, demonstration, was the precise teamwork. And as a, as a tow truck operator, you're coming on that scene too, and you're part of that team. So. It's this combination, Mary, is Mary sort of mentioning of being able to make a quick assessment and quick individual decisions, but also 
be part of a team on a scene. And I guess I'm wondering how, <coughs> how you see some of the qualities you have, the experiences you have, what would make you a good team player for the Hingham Police Department? Yeah, whether it's working with the police or working with other tow drivers that I work with, um, you have to be able to work through and plan quickly and effectively on how you're going to get the job done and get it clear so that the roadway is clean. Yep. Um, and then I, I noticed that you've got a number of specialized um, trainings that I think are, are very relevant. I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about your EMT training, your firearms training, um, the time you've taken to uh, educate yourself and, and, you know, to me, put yourself on a, a stronger track to be a, a police officer. So I did an EMT course in 2013 and 14, and it was like four months. And I got through the whole entire course, and you learn a lot. And um, I unfortunately didn't pass the national exam, but I learned a lot from it. And um, yeah, and then my firearms course, it's a lot of gun safety. And even then, yeah, I still practice gun safety, going to the gun range and all that. And so it's good. That's great. Thank you. Did, um, did you have any questions for us, or is there anything else that um, you'd want to make sure that we were aware of? I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for this time and this opportunity. I'm grateful for it. Um, we are grateful, too. You know, as, uh, I think an important part of community policing is uh, having the opportunity to have people who have grown up in this community and who know this community step forward. and. Um, I think when we have candidates such as yourself who have been in Hingham, um, it really just helps, helps the police department with its mission. So we, we know that there are a lot of different options that are out there, and we're very grateful that you're considering coming to work for the town. So um, we thank you so much, and uh, we'll be making our decision next week. Thank you. Have thank a good you. So uh, uh, there will be some additional work being completed by the police department. We will take this matter up again uh, next week. And um, how nice to see that we have three local people yeah, really good, good, coming forward. Good for candidates, Chief. It's, uh, it's really nice to see. So um, we have a forecast update that's scheduled to begin at 8 o'clock when the advisory committee is going to join us. So uh, what I'm actually going to do is to um, take up our possible votes. I believe we might have an appointment, Selectman Town Administrator reports. So um, our first vote is Lincoln Day. And Lincoln Day this year in the town of Hingham will be on Saturday, February 10th. There will be a ceremony at the Old Ship Church at 11 o'clock. Uh, and then we will process to the Lincoln statue. And uh, it is customary for this board to uh, sign a proclamation. And while it's long, I, I seem to remember that you've read this in years past. I have, and I'd be happy to do so. Again, oh, terrific. The board is so inclined. Please. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Hingham, this is the town of Hingham, Massachusetts proclamation. Whereas the town of Hingham was settled in 1635 by a small band of Puritan pilgrims, many of whom came from Hingham, England, and environs. And whereas among the descendants of those original settlers were two famous American public figures who shared the common family name Lincoln, as well as a common heritage. And whereas it is a long-standing Hingham tradition to honor and celebrate their birthdays, General Benjamin Lincoln, a lifelong Hingham citizen and hero of the American Revolution, and Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president and the towering figure of the Civil War. And whereas, we honor and celebrate the lives and deeds of the two Lincolns because of the indelible legacy of community building and preservation they have left for us. And whereas, in this year, 2000 and 18, we pay special honor to four centuries of our citizens, 
those famous like Benjamin Lincoln and Abraham Lincoln, and those unknown to history who worked in a myriad of ways to build and sustain this wonderful community of Hingham and the broader communities of state and nation. And whereas the preservation of community is a perpetual task in which each generation must fully participate. Now therefore, we the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Hingham do hereby officially proclaim Saturday, February 10th, 2018, Lincoln Day. We urge also that as many citizens as possible join us at the Old Ship Church on Saturday, February 10th, 2018 at 11 a.m. for a patriotic ceremony of celebration. Finally, we urge each citizen to take to heart the examples of the two Lincolns and those are four centuries of Hingham citizens, and we urge each citizen to participate in some concrete way in the strengthening and preservation of this community of Hingham and the broader communities of state and nations for the generations which will succeed us. Given under our hands and seal of Hingham this 30th day of January 2018, Mary Power Chairman, Paul K. Healy, Karen A. Johnson. I've got a tough act to follow next Saturday when I have to read this at the old ship. Um, I, would like, I would like to make a motion to proclaim February 10th, 2018 as Lincoln Day in the town of Hingham. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We have uh, two votes. We have a vote for a uh, license. Do you want to do the appointment or no? Uh, sure, why don't we do the appointment? Um, I'd like to move that we appoint Jacqueline Zane to the Conservation Commission to fill an unexpired term ending June 30, 2019. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd like to uh, congratulate, thank Ms. Zane, congratulate her, and say that we are uh, looking, looking forward, forward to forward your to beginning her. to serve the town. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Zane. Uh, we have a, a license. I move to approve the issuance of the special one-day wine and malt beverages license to Diane DiNapoli on behalf of Special Needs Athletic Partnership for the SNAP St. Patrick's Day party to be held at the Kingham Community Center on Saturday, March 9, 2018, from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Chief's not here, but my understanding is he has approved this. Yes. Yes. Uh, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then, uh, lastly, we. Uh, Tom walked us through the Town of Hingham Street Acceptance Policy at our, la I believe that was at our last meeting. Yes. And um, we, as we do with a lot of these, we uh, decided to hold off. I, I don't believe there was any feedback from, uh, from the community, and I believe that um, Attorney Murphy received confirmation from staff that everybody was comfortable with it, Tom? Yes, it's been fully circulated. Everyone was comfortable with it and received nothing from the And board. I talked to Tom separately and um, uh, Susan Murphy as well. Okay, we good to go on this? Move to approve the Town of Hingham Street Acceptance Policy for Insertion in Board of Selectmen Policies and Procedures Manual. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, so let's... Uh, why don't we do uh, selectmen and town administrator reports? Tom? So do you not want to vote Article C until later? You want to wait on that? I think I'm just going to wait only because. I just because, don't want to forget it. Yep. yep. Only because okay. that's posted at 9.15. So okay. if people can help remind me so we don't, <laughs> we don't miss that. Um, Tom, town sure. administrator report? Sure. So uh, in the good news category, we have a couple of grants to announce from this week. The Hingham and Situate Boards of Health working together have received an 18-month grant for $25,000 from the Blue Hill Community Health Alliance. This will address uh, the ho a hoarding disorder, uh, associated clutter, and the related stigma through public health education and clinician-led online treatment groups. The data will be collected by the BU School of Social Work and be published in a peer-reviewed journal article. Uh, we've also received an engineering grant um, through the Town of Hingham's Engineering Department acting through the Board of Selectmen. We've received a $50,000 planning assistance grant from the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. 
The grant will augment and offset the town's cost for the ongoing efforts associated with designing, engineering, and permitting resiliency improvements to strengthen the coastal infrastructure within Hingham's Inner Harbor. And if anyone was down the harbor this morning with that tide, uh, you'll see why this is um, uh, timely, a timely grant to receive. We had some minor coastal flooding down there this morning. And finally, I just wanted to thank everyone over at the Hingham DPW for their efforts to clear today's storm. This was a tricky storm. It came in uh, a little bit late, around 6 a.m. or a little bit earlier, right at the beginning of the, of the, the morning commute. It was a heavier than anticipated storm, a lot of high winds and drifting. And, um, you know, we got 110 miles of roadway and 60 miles of sidewalk that these folks have to, do, have to clear. And when you're out treating them and all of a sudden you get a heavier than normal storm and you've got to go switch all your equipment to plows from, treat, from treatment equipment, it's, um, it's, a, it's a heavy lift. And they did a great job today, I thought. Yeah, and I feel like that then they switched back to treatment at the end, you know, when it started to get cold this afternoon, the salt trucks were back out there. They're so, back yeah, out, that's right. It's a, a really, really great job. And I would uh, just, just add to that that um, our preparation for the storm this morning actually began about 2.30 this morning, right. which is when all of the crews were out sanding and salting the road um, in anticipation of the snow and waiting for it. So, uh, that's you know, that's, that's, a, that's a very long effort, and I suspect that there are some people who have not been home uh, for close to 24 hours because, uh, as Tom said, we have 110 miles of roadway and 60 miles of sidewalk. Thank you. Anything else, Tom? That's it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Paul? Um, I'm throwing off my game because I thought this was <laughs> going to be done at the end. Okay. Um, Do you want me to go to Karen? Sure. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so a couple things uh, on the sort of work side, I'm continuing uh, really to concentrate my efforts on um, some veterans issues uh, with Keith German and Father Bills as well as some affordable housing issues with the Affordable Housing Trust, um, the housing and the housing authority and again with, with Father Bills. So that's sort of the bulk of my office time. I'd like to give a couple, uh, a couple of shout outs. One is to Lily Farden and Team USA, the U18 hockey team, who won gold medal in Russia uh, about, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. Really, really fantastic effort. It was fun to, uh, fun to keep up with that news. Uh, and then on, on uh, the veterans front, I'd like to say that uh, both the wrestling team and the girls basketball team this week will be honoring our veterans at their matches and basketball games, respectively. Wrestling is tomorrow evening, I think around 6.30, and the girls um, basketball game is this Friday evening at 6.30. And, you know, you've talked about the, um, the Veterans Appreciation Club at the high school. Um, you know, the fact that these sports teams are taking um, special time to, to recognize the outstanding contributions of our veterans, I just think is, um, is admirable. So if you can get out and support our teams and our veterans, that'd be terrific. Okay. I'm, I'm going to give you a couple, a couple more minutes. I'll do my, mine and then uh, no pressure. No pressure. Um, I wanted to just mention that, uh, first of all, the um, uh, Mass Municipal Association, the MMA, had its annual meeting a couple Fridays ago. Um, Tom attended, I attended. Jay McGrail's in the audience for something that's coming up along with Emily Wentworth. And this is a day-long conference with colleagues. Uh, we heard the governor speak. We had a chance to attend workshops. Um, I attended a workshop actually on uh, public safety. Uh, with the Chelsea police chief that was just fascinating. I attended a legal update so that I could keep up with my two, uh, my two colleagues. Uh, it was just a really uh, nice opportunity. I also attended a, uh, a women's elected official breakfast and it was really nice to see the number of women who uh, are in leadership positions in the Commonwealth. So it was really a, a great day, a chance to share best practices, network, um, there's a trade show component where a number of Hingham's partners were there and it's nice to catch up with them in that setting as well. I don't know if you had anything to add about the MMA. Yeah, it was the same for me. I, you know, I always love the trade show in there. You get to see the, the breadth of services and, um, and equipment that's used to keep municipalities running across the state. Um, and I got, to, I got to attend some, some wonderful budgeting seminars as well as social media use. Um, these are all burgeoning topics that are, that are important to stay on top of. So. And I would also say that in, in looking at some of that, for example, I was at, at 
this one about the police force. And as they were sharing a lot of best, best practices and different things, I found myself with, with many of them saying, yep, we do that. Yep, we do that. And it, it actually was very, you know, not just a chance to learn some new things, but it just reinforced to me that um, how well run Hingham is, which is a great credit to, uh, to our teams. Um, last Saturday, the, um, you know, we're in the middle of budget. We're going to do a forecast update in a minute. Um, I attended the uh, school budget discussion with the advisory subcommittee and the school committee. Uh, we spent about three hours on a Saturday morning um, talking about the school budget, which uh, I'm grateful for everybody's time. I would mention to the public that uh, tomorrow evening, beginning at 7 o'clock at the Hingham Middle School, is a Hingham Education Forum that is being sponsored by the uh, six PTOs across the Hingham Public School. And this is an opportunity to ask questions and have dialogue about many things. Um, our appreciation to members of the school committee and members of the school administration and principals um, for making themselves available for what is going to prove to be, I think, a very, a very informative evening. Um, before I turn it over to Mr. Healy, I'd, I'd also mention on a, on a more somber note that within the last three weeks, um, Hingham has lost three citizens who have contributed to our community in many ways um, through working for the town, through volunteering for the town. And um, uh, we regrettably lost uh, Tom Studley and John Stoddard and Willis Ertman. And on behalf of the board and town, uh, we offer our condolences to their families and our gratitude for the many, many contributions that each of them made uh, to just make this community a, a better place. So, Paul, anything else? Um, you know, no, no. I, I think I'm good. Uh, just because I'm not talking doesn't mean I'm not busy. I've said that before. I'll, I'll say it again. We all work in our respective uh, roles as selectmen addressing you know inquiries that the town makes and serving its needs you know I was outside Saturday as I'm sure many of you were enjoying the weather and uh, one of my neighbors came over and he st started providing me with his opinion of an issue in town and he stopped himself and said gee I, I really apologize you're on your day off and I said as a selectman I'm never off so go ahead and keep talking <laughs> uh, and, th and that's how it is you know if people have a, a beef or a problem, um, you know, you pick up the phone, my number's in the book. Um, so that's all I really want to yeah, say. Yeah, I, I was going to say, make sure you call Paul. <laughs> <laughs> or a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, they happen on occasion. Okay. So uh, I think uh, it's 8, it's eight o'clock, and um, the advisory committee has joined us, and, and we welcome them. Uh, before we get into the joint session on community preservation, uh, we're going to do a forecast update. And uh, you know, just for the audience, one of, one of the things around this time of year, we're we're working. The advisory committee is working on settling the town budget, and in an effort to try to share a little bit more information, um, but also recognizing that people are watching from home, and sometimes. The, the page of very small print really doesn't show up very well on the TV screen. So what we've tried to do, and we've got it up on the screen, is to just put together a, a little bit of an overview presentation. Um, members of the advisory committee have copies of our very detailed forecast document. We also have additional copies at the table, so anyone is more than welcome. Um, but Tom is just going to kind of walk through a little bit of where we are, and then uh, I'm going to touch on one thing at the end. So Great. Uh, turn it over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Mary. OK. So again, in an effort to try to simplify the forecast, which can be complicated, we, um, we tried to break it down into a more uh, understandable flow. So the financial forecast for Hingham is generally split into two categories, one revenue and the other expenses. Mm -hmm. And the, so the revenue outlook in town, and we have a comparison for, for the projected FY19 versus the, um, the anticipated in FY18. So the tax levy in FY18 was uh, approximately $80 million, with the projected 19 tax uh, levy of $82.3 million. Other revenue from 18 was 274 
and in 19 we're anticipating other revenue dropping to 27.2. For a total forecasted revenues in 18 of 107.4, that's $107,400,000. And in, for FY19 projection of $109,500,000. So expenses, and it's, in, it's important to understand that we're still early in the process. Where these um, budgets are still being reviewed. So these are the early expenses, and this includes a simple 2% increase over the prior year for the school budget. Um, and obviously that will, that will change to some extent as we go through the budgeting process. But for now, in these numbers, you're looking at a simple 2% increase. So in Articles 4, 5, and 6, you're looking at an FY18 uh, um, number of 103.5 million with the projection for FY19 of 106.5, capital outlay of 2.2 in 18 to 2.3 in 19, and with a, a total of some other categories equaling 1.4 uh, million in expenses in 18 and 1.5 in 19. And that brings our totals to about 107.3 million in uh, expenses for 18 with the projection of 110.3 in 19. So in 18 we saw a, a, a slight surplus at the end of the process of just about $100,000. And in 19, as of today, we're budgeting, or we're looking at about an $800,000 uh, deficit. However, that will change, and I'll go into that here in a minute. So our next page, uh, we recap some of the revenue numbers, and we summar summarize that. So you're looking at approximately, in revenue, you're looking at approximately a 2.1% increase. I'm sorry, a $2.1 million or 2% increase over a prior year uh, anticipated in revenue. So updates since the first forecast was presented back in November. We're looking at a decrease in our new growth projections of about $325,000. That's largely due to some of the larger projects in town not being built on the timeline we were anticipating earlier in the year. And that includes some of the ones down the ship, down the shipyard, the Avalon, Brio, um, and uh, Linden Ponds building, et cetera. So state aid, we got the, Mary and I were at the MMA in Boston last week and we heard the governor's budget pr presentation and he's looking at approximately for the town of Hingham of about uh, $188,000 increase in state aid this year. Now again, that's the governor's budget, subject to change as it goes through their process. And then local receipts, we're looking at approximately $280,000 increase over last year. Motor vehicle, ex to break that down, you're looking at about $150,000 in uh, anticipated increase in motor vehicle uh, excise tax, the meals tax of an increase of about $80,000, and $25,000 in each in licenses, fees, and permits, and ambulance fees. So the potential updates to the FY19 budget, the, as, I as I just stated, the state aid number is a projected number right now. That's just the governor's budget. Still has to go through the entire state review process. So that's subject to change. The local receipts, the FY19 local receipt forecast, it's important to note that we're looking at about nine, just under 95. So 94.8 percent of the FY17 actuals, which was the last actual as the town has realized. Um, you know, 95 percent is, uh, is kind of our threshold. We don't like to, to project a whole lot higher than that. Uh, it, gets, it gets iffy, and, and as we learned in 2008 across the state, um, higher projections can be dangerous. Okay, our next slide is a simple pie chart trying to uh, explain how revenue, comp uh, the revenue components, uh, where they come from. So if you're looking at the largest piece of the pie, the 70 percent of, of all the revenue coming in is coming from the tax levy, approximately 10 percent from state aid, Approximately 8% from local receipts. 5% uh, is the country club and the sewer. Uh, it's important to, real, to remember that those are offset by their, um, by their enterprise fund. And then about 4% from the excluded debt and 2% through other categories including new growth. Uh, it's very important that we, uh, at this time, to note that we do not expect additional significant revenue change. The, re the large revenue changes just occurred, right? So between November and this forecast, the lo those are the largest revenue changes we're going to see. 
Okay, so expenses. This is the other side of the forecast. Uh, these haven't been as flushed out uh, yet. We're still in the middle of the process. The school department will be coming in next week for a joint meeting with the board and ADCOM uh, here in this room next Tuesday. So we'll probably get some new, some new information at that meeting. But for now, again, to recap, we're looking at um, expenses of 107.3 million in 18 to 110.3 million in 19, or a $3 million change equaling approximately 2.8% increase. And again, that is with a school budget increase estimated at 2%. And we know that that will be higher. So what, so what does that mean? So the updates since the last forecast, there haven't been any expense updates, which is why we're looking at the same numbers. The potential updates, and this is really where a lot of people are probably thinking, yes, this is likely to change. The group insurance, we don't know, haven't received that number yet from the GIC. So the town joined the GIC, which is a state um, health plan provider, last year. We haven't received their anticipated uh, change over last year yet for this coming year. We hope to receive that in, um, in late January. So that number will change as a, as, a, uh, as a potential expense. The education budget. Uh, we've seen some presentations uh, publicly, both on the school committee and others, uh, where they're projecting about a, an, an additional increase over what, we, what we're proposing in here of an another, another $2 million to bring their total increase to approximately 6.1% over, over last year. Uh, again, that's not in here yet, simply because it hasn't gone all the way through that process. Capital outrage recommendation, uh, we haven't received that yet. They're coming in in a couple of weeks, um, and uh, they'll, we'll, we'll go through their process as well then. The town budget recommendations, right? Now the administration proposed budget does include a $264,000 in additional requests beyond my message of level service budget. Uh, and that equaled approximately a 3.9% total increase. Okay, what are the next steps? So on... Uh, next Tuesday, February 6th, we'll be holding, the selectmen will be holding a joint school, a joint meeting with the school committee and advisory to flush out the school, the school's budget. That presentation and discussion will occur again next Tuesday in this room. In mid-February, we hope to hear from Capital Outlay. And in late February, early March, in that time frame, we haven't got the dates yet, the, um, all three of the, the selectmen, the school committee and advisory will be voting the budgets. Okay. Before we yeah. So, do you, um, Paul or Karen, any questions for Tom or any comments? Um, yeah, I mean, it may, may be a little granular at this stage of the game, um, uh, but I, it, it maybe you and I could can chat and we can bring it back next time. But I'm I'm wondering about the carrying of the meals tax within the local receipts line item. Um, is that where it's all baked in there? Mm -hmm. So there's no separate meals tax stabilization fund like the meals tax reserve that we I see carried through FY19. So the the meals tax the meals tax uh, reserve <laughs> that is going through 19 was the first we we accumulated about two million dollars in the meals tax fund before we moved them into local receipts. And the idea was to give that back over about five years to just sort of smooth it out. So next year will be the last year of that. Okay. The other meals tax are in the local receipts number of 9.9 .9 million. The detail is back on, uh, I think it's page four. And the meals tax amount right now, Tom, it's 800, right? Yes. $800,000. Okay. okay. And I'm sorry, Tom, you said those, those numbers are being carried at 94% of actuals? Yes, 94.8. 94.8. That's the overall. The actual, yeah. So by the, the meals tax number specifically, Karen, was at 99.3 of the 17 actuals. Okay. But overall, so overall in the aggregate, local receipts are being carried at about just under 95% of actuals. Right? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Okay. I mean, you know, so just so everybody knows, right, um, the forecast group meets, um, but because we have three selectmen, we can only have one selectman in the forecast room. So um, 
I, I said to Tom just the other day, I was, I was glad that this was, you know, coming up at this time because, you know, we sort of operate outside, um, outside this level of detail. So, um, you know, I appreciate the presentation tonight and, um, you know, I, I am going to spend some time with it and we'll likely have a question or two. <laughs> I'm always here for you. So I know you are. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, I mean, if, if you look at it, if you were to roll in all the numbers that we have right now, we have a $2.8 million deficit right now, which is, I think, a little larger than we've had in past years at this time. Um, we've had them over two, um, but it, it, at least for me, it feels like it's within reach. It's more challenging this okay. year. Um, I think we've been talking for three or four years that revenue growth was going to slow down and I think we're seeing that materialize and um, so we uh, are going to, we're going to have our work cut out for us um, and you know as you look at the components of revenue as Tom said, you know with the local receipts and the new growth if we are too aggressive in forecasting those amounts there's no other place to make up that revenue. We would have to dip into our fund balance, our rainy day fund, and that got us into some trouble 10 years ago, so we don't want to do that. Right. And that's why, as we're looking, for example, at our local receipts, we don't want to be overly aggressive. Uh, two years ago, as an example, ambulance fees kind of dropped off unexpectedly uh, to the tune of a couple of hundred thousand dollars because of some changes in, I think it was Medicaid. Um, so, you know, I, I would just affirm with this board, we uh, back in, I think it was October or November, uh, we talked about the fact that when we had the forecast review back in November, we said this was the revenue that was on the table, that we didn't envision uh, any sort of an override, we didn't envision uh, applying any of the unused levy capacity because that was offsetting the cost of the middle school. Um, I guess I'm just kind of looking to my colleagues. I, I haven't changed my mind on that. I'm nodding in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I think that's the message everybody got, um, frankly, in November, was that this is the pie that we had to work with. And, um, you know, no, I, I, yeah. I have no appetite for that. And uh, just, just to sort of dimensionalize that a little bit, at the, I mentioned that I was at the Saturday uh, advisory meeting with, with the school committee, and there was some conversation about, you know, um, how Hingham kind of compares to other communities, and we know we like to do a lot of benchmarking in this town. We're, we're good at that. It's one of the reasons we're a AAA, and what we do is we take 20 communities, and, and the personnel board identified these communities many years ago, and, and some of them are geographically close to Hingham. Some of them are comparable in size and demographics to Hingham. Some of them perhaps um, a little bit uh, different in terms of demographics. So we have some communities like um, the W communities, Wellesley and Weston, that perhaps are a little more affluent than Hingham. We have other communities that are nearby. Um, and, you know, there was some talk about, well, you know, how do we compare and you know, does that mean that, that, you know, we have some opportunity with revenue? And um, I mentioned some numbers off the cuff that had been done about six or seven years ago and went back after and updated it. And I just want to share this with, with my colleagues and with the audience for a second because I think it paints the picture for why this board is saying that the revenue we have is the revenue we have. So if you look at Hingham up at the very top, if you look at our 2017 residential tax bill, it's $11.77 for every $1,000 of assessed value. So that's how our tax bills are calculated. And you know what? If you go and you compare that to the 20 towns that are listed on the bottom of the screen, we are number 18 out of 20. Ours is one of the lowest. And you know, I would like to, I would like to think that that's part of what attracts people to Hingham. The property values can be high, but relative to some other communities, we have a, a fairly low tax rate. But I think just looking at that tax rate by itself doesn't really tell you a lot about Hingham. So let me take it a step further. Our average single family property tax bill in FY18 is $9,489, where we're ranked number 11 out of 20. 
So while our tax rate is lower compared to some of our peer communities, because of the value of our properties, the tax bill checks that we all write is a little bit higher. Comparing the median household income for all those communities, Hingham's median household income is $106,854, which ranks as 12 out of those 20 benchmark communities. And then the last piece I just say is, so, so let's just think about putting ourselves, you know, we're all taxpayers. So what that means is if we take our average property tax bill against our household income, for, for somebody in Hingham, your property tax bill is about just under 9% of your total budget, your household budget. And what was noteworthy to me is that when I compared that to the other 19 benchmark communities, we are ranked number six. And so what that says to me is that as we're thinking about our revenue picture and we're thinking about the citizens in this community, we need to understand against a backdrop of all of this that for many households in Hingham, the existing property tax bill is a big burden. It is a bigger burden to a household budget than it may be in other communities. So while our tax rate might be one of the lowest, we need to keep in mind the check people are paying and the proportion of their income. And understand that in this community with many seniors and with many young families, the median household income, we, we have, I think we have a little bit more uh, economic diversity than some of our other communities. And there are a couple other things we need to think about. We need to keep in mind the new tax law. Remember that for exemption, the property tax exemption, the combination of property tax and state tax, it's a $10,000 limit. Our average tax bill is just about 10000 So, you know, I think some people, probably a lot of people on the advisory committee, you already know what the impact of, of the tax bill is on, you know, of, of the tax law on your, on your tax bill. But I think what we may find is that there are people who could be adversely affected by that. Um, I think we also have to keep in mind, again, as I said, the percentage of household income. And the third thing I think we all have to remember, too, is that we have a lot of capital projects, very worthy capital projects that we've talked about before. We've talked about the wharfs, we've talked about a school, we've talked about town hall, the library, fire stations, you know, country, potential numbers, 50 to 80 million dollars. And when the, advisory, when, when the advisory committee was with us a few months ago, they talked about the fact that within our budget, we've got, we've got room in the next five years for about $16 million of projects. So what that says to me is that if those large capital projects move forward, we might be in a position where we have to ask the taxpayers if, if they would be willing to pay for those things. <coughs> What that says to me, all the more important, is that we have to live within our means with the revenue that we have. We have to keep the taxpayers in mind. We have to understand, you know, just keep some of this stuff in mind. And um, so as, as we're moving forward and, and we're looking, uh, while I think we may have a little bit of a challenge with the budget, um, what that information says to me is that, is that uh, we, we have a responsibility to keep all this in mind as we move forward with, with what may be some difficult decisions. I think it's a really helpful slide, Mary, and I appreciate you and Tom uh, taking the time to pull it together. I think they're, they're very useful metrics. I think they're, it, it gives you a visual of, I think, the feeling that we all have, but it gives you a, a visual um, and, uh, and some data to, um, to, to analyze it against. So I appreciate both you and Tom taking the time to pull that together. I would echo that. Um, as I said before, when people speak to me from this town, that, that's the one consistent message that I get uniformly across the board, the costs. I, I, I said at the school committee meeting that um, the dilemma for a lot of us in this room and our advisory colleagues, um, people in town would like great services, really nice stuff, and low taxes. And those three things aren't necessarily all compatible. So the job we have with our school committee partners as well 
is to figure out how do we strike that balance as we move forward. And we have always done that in a uh, collaborative uh, way, and um, uh, we look forward to doing that again. Anything else on this? Okay. Um, so next on the agenda, so um, many of you weren't here when Paul Healy so eloquently read the proclamation for Lincoln Day, but there was one line that I thought was a really good introduction to our next topic. In our proclamation, we talked about the preservation of community is a perpetual task in which each generation must fully participate. And that's what we're really about to do right now with the community preservation. And um, so I'd like to invite Carol Piles and uh, yeah, and Lucy, Carol. we thought maybe Lucy if you Ron. wanted to come up to the table so as we're going through projects. And Jim, welcome. Well, you know, we thought if, if you're probably more comfortable sitting. going to be giving the pres presentation. Yep. And you know, if, if I could just ask before, uh, before we started, and Carol, maybe we'll, um, we'll, we'll ask you first, but um, you have members of your team at the table. You have members of your team in the audience. I just ask you to introduce the members of your committee and your team, and then Lucy, if you could please introduce the members of the advisory committee that are here this evening. Um, these groups of people have been working pretty long hours, pretty hard to do great work, and um, I think it's important that, that the community knows uh, who's, who's behind all the great work we're going to see. <coughs> Does it matter? Or behind us, okay. Go ahead, yes, sure. Hi, good evening. I'm Carol Piles, Chairman of Community Preservation Committee. To my right is my Vice Chairman, Jim Conroy, and Carol Costello, who makes us all look good. And uh, is Roger coming tonight, do we know? Yes. And Roger is also okay. And other members of our committee who are here tonight are Dan White and Jim Watson and Larry Lindner and Bill Harrington, and anyone else here? No? And then the others in the committee who are not here be Sarah Corey, and um, Bob Mosier, and Vicki Donlan. Thank okay. you. We're delighted to present such good projects to you this evening. This is really a challenge, because these chairs just <laughs> Before you start, if I could just ask Lucy to introduce the members of the advisory Switch committee. Chairs. No, it's the whole, it's the floor. Do you want this one? Right, it's Donna Smallwood, vice chair. Uh, in the front row over here, we have Bob Curley, Aaron Kelly, Evan Sheehan. Next row, Julie Straley, George Danis, Dave Anderson, Nicole Straley, Victor Balterra. Next row. Uh, Libby Claypool, I'm looking, uh, Dan Coughlin, is there anybody between you? No, okay, and Tom's, uh, Tom Bellier. And I think we're missing one person, two people. I don't see the other two yet. Did they get here? No, okay. Did I miss anyone? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Lucy. So you will be changing the slides as we go along, Carol? The first thing we want to talk about tonight is that CPA has been around uh, since 2000 and we joined early on. We were one of the early towns. And so since 2003, uh, we have been able to devote $22,211,000 back to our town in terms of historic preservation, open space, community housing, and then in 2013, uh, recreation was also added, so those projects have come in. And you can see on that first page the percentage, and we still have the same challenge we had last year when we presented to you, and that is we desperately are trying to get community housing's share of the pot a little higher, and we were maybe able to do that a little bit more this year. Okay, the next page is just some random pictures of some of the projects that we'll be presenting to you tonight. We call it Bells and Pools, but you can, as you can see from the picture. The next page is CPC recommendations to the town meeting for 2018. And we'll go through each one of these individually, but they are our administrative fund, Hingham Affordable Housing Trust Opportunity Fund, 
conservation of historic town documents, Hingham Cemetery erosion control, Memorial Bell Tower mechanism repair, the old Ford House, that's the Richardson House, archaeology and installation, Harbor Walkway extension, the Hull Street Field play area, and the South Shore Country Club pool design and construction design. And in our numbers, you will note as we go through that our debt service payments are also included. We're paying off the Heritage Museum at 165,000 plus per year, and the Laner property at 315,000 per year. And Carol, can I just ask you, do those, yeah. um, do those debt service payments count in the category of the projects? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, Thank they do. You. Sorry for the interruption. Okay. On the next page, we have the Community Preservation Committee revenue, and luckily it adds up to the same number as we had on the last page. Um, and of course, this comes from the 1.5% um, surcharge on your property taxes, and so that first number, a million, 11,594 is this year's collection. The state contribution for this year is 174,000. And we have accumulated in reserve and clawed back from unfinished projects 388,000. So that all goes into us having a million 573 and change to spend this year. And if you break it into categories, which is always a very interesting look, you realize that our uh, community housing has gone way up this year. We were able to truly fund them at a level that made us very happy. Historic open space and recreation, which adds up to the same number. <coughs> okay, so the first is our own uh, community uh, preservation committee administrative fund. And it's $50,000 this year. This account enables the CPC to operate, quite literally. We couldn't do it without them. The CPC Act allows a total of 5% of the town's annual CPA budget to be used for administrative fund. This request, and there's a typo here in the next line, this request is a total of 4.2%, not 2.4%, of available funds for this year, that 1,185,000. This is a rolling fund that does not coincide with the fiscal year. These funds are available at any time for unexpected legal fees, costs associated with CPA projects. And the one question we always get is why the legal fees so high, especially since we have three lawyers on the committee this year, but that doesn't affect us. Uh, that's used for uh, uh, the town council service, uh, land deed registrations, closing costs, conservation restrictions, surveying, and land acquisition expenses. Okay. The Hingham Affordable Housing Trust. Um, we were able to put together $464,500 for them this year. The proponent is the Hingham Affordable Housing Trust. The scope is funds are set aside in the HAHT Opportunity Fund to assist with creation and preservation of affordable housing in Hingham. Thank you all know what that is. Any questions? Yeah, so um, uh, for the Opportunity Fund, I, I know with some of your other projects you talked about, um, you talked about a clawback. Um, with the Opportunity Fund, is there some presumed length of time that the uh, Housing Trust would need to spend? Not necessarily, although this year, because we had given them money in the past for a project on Beale Street, which I think you all and, and others have said, please hold up on that. So that put it in a lockbox for them, and it was a big chunk of money. So with discussion with them and a vote, we decided to take that back and re-gift it this year uh, so it goes into their opportunity fund, which they can use for anything. If it had stayed where it was, it was only for that particular project, and they couldn't have used it for anything else. So that helped us get their number up higher this okay. year. And so what's the net grant aside from the clawback funds then? What, what, what's the new money this year? Well, they're 10 percent, which is 118,000. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but their clawback and that adds up to 464 plus is 106,000 in new money. 
I think, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact breakdown for okay. okay. Yeah. It's so a combination of new plus reuse of their old money plus the natural 10% that they have to get. Okay, okay. And um, and the, the sort of that clawback circle allows them greater flexibility in the use of the originally granted funds. They can use it for anything, and if the Beale Street property comes back online again, they can use it for that too. Great, thank you. Okay, now Jim's going to give us the next presentation. Okay, so this is uh, phase two of a three-phase project, or possibly a four-phase project, to conserve and um, fortify the ancient town records that uh, we have in the clerk's office, uh, which date back to the middle of the 17th century. Um, last year, uh, ten bound volumes were restored, conserved. Uh, this year, uh, we recommend $3,050 to fund the projected cost of restoring another dozen of those volumes. Um, and you can see from the slide in the handout that uh, they are ancient and uh, fragile and uh, subject to loss if they're not conserved and cared for. So um, the um, Conservation is done by a professional who repairs rips and bindings and fortifies weak pages and such. Uh, came, on, came in under his estimated cost last year, and uh, we're hopeful of, uh, if not doing that, at least not exceeding the 3,000 this year. And uh, next year after that, the hope is to, um, if not uh, deal with the remaining 50 volumes that have not yet been dealt with, which are a little later. Um, then at least uh, maybe half of those and then finish it up the year after that. Um, so is there any plan to digitize any of these records? There is talk about it, but there is no specific plan as yet. It's quite costly to do that, okay. uh, but um, that is the hope and the longer term goal. Okay. Yeah. And um, storage at the town clerk's office, so once the volumes have been repaired, stabilized and fully conserved, are, are there any any sort of special care that the clerk needs to take or we should be taking in order to preserve the volumes once they've been conserved? Um, I'm not aware of any special hermetically sealed chambers or anything <laughs> of that kind, but um, there is talk and discussion about a longer range uh, hope to, um, to store and conserve all of the town and possibly the historical society documents in one place. Um, but for the moment, the conservator is confident that the conditions in the town clerk's office are adequate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. They are being stored in acid-free boxes. If that yeah. Happens. Sounds good to me. Sounds exactly it sounds better than like acid. It's boxes. Start. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, the next one, um, cemetery Hingham Cemetery erosion control. Um, if you look at, you'll probably all rec recognize the place we're talking about. It's the corner. Uh, a corner of the uh, cemetery adjacent to the old ship church. It's been described to us as uh, sort of a confluence of three historic assets, the cemetery itself, the old ship church, and the bell tower, which all come together at that point. And um, the immediate concern is the erosion of that slope that you see on the slide. Um, some of those hilltop graves will end up in that driveway uh, if they are not uh, contained and controlled pretty promptly. Um, and many of them are 17th century graves. And um, the cemetery uh, board looked at a number of alternatives to try to stop that erosion control, but that, that's their first priority of a multi-year plan for the cemetery. But that one's the urgent need because of that continued erosion. And they considered a stone wall to retain uh, that space, but figured out in their own calculations that that would be prohibitively expensive. Uh, and also, I've heard that there could be a kind of an echo chamber effect from those bells bouncing off a stone wall. Uh, so uh, they've opted for a shrubbery-oriented containment system instead, uh, have engaged uh, Sean Povich landscape architects to um, re advise them on that, and they are advised that those shrubs will do the job and uh, be adequately irrigated and such. So um, that's a $15,000 recommendation. 
um, that we came to. And you said that this is potentially the first in a multi-year plan? Yeah, but not, I, I suspect that most of, not all of that will be handled by other grants and by their own resources. Uh, don't know that for sure, but, but in the near term, we're not, we're not being asked to do any more than that. Thank Landscaping you. and such is up to them. And is there any risk that the root structure or the shrubbery would disturb the vaults? Apparently not. No, I asked that question too. They're going to be building out with a lot of soil first. So yeah. the embankments like this, they'll bring it out and then do the planting. Okay. And next is a memorial bell tower mechanisms. So behind Old Ship Church, with the graveyard behind you on the left, this is the 75-foot brick tower that you see, and it contains 10 change bells. Now, bells ring in a lot of ways. You can hold the bell, bell steady and ring the clangor. You can ring the bell itself. Change bells are pulled by ropes and go up into an open mouth, they call it, uh, position in the sky. And then when they pull the, the rope again, and it takes a, a whole person pulling down on it, the bell comes down, hits the clangor, makes one sound, and goes back up again. And that's what change bells are. These are very rare and very unique. Um, they are direct copies of bells from Hingham, England. So in 1912, when the town decided to do a memorial tower for the 275th anniversary of the town, money was collected, it was just donated from everyone in town, and they built this 75-foot tower and put the change bells up there. The bells are perfect. Nothing's happened to them. No one shot at them or anything over the years. They're great. But the part they sit in, if you can see the red on the picture, um, that part has been wearing out. They're open to the air, and uh, eventually that iron gets rusty, and they need to be replaced. Now, out of the 10 bells, only two have become very difficult to ring. And bell ringers who really know what they're doing can barely get them to work anymore. So we're going to start with these two. We know they'll be back to us in the future for the rest. But so far, they're able to ring them, and these are the two they want done. They were made at the Whitechapel Bell Foundry in London, which also made the Liberty Bell and Big Ben. So they're very famous. They're wonderful bells. Uh, the smallest one is 550 pounds, and the biggest one is 2,262 pounds. Wow. They're enormous and wonderful to hear. That sound, if you, even if you don't live in that part of town, you can hear the sound when there's uh, church events and town meetings and they're rung for all kinds of things. And these bell ringers are a wonderful group. They're part of an international group that comes to visit and they trade information and they ring each other's bells. And they, you know, it's a terrific group. So uh, somebody said this may have been the last sound that our Hingham founders for our town heard when they left home would have been the ringing of these bells when they took off in their ships to come to America. And here we have the, the replicas of them making the same sounds. It's very touching, I think. So anyway, um, we, we want to help them get up there with a crane and repair the first two, knowing they'll be back to us over the years to get the rest done eventually. Where will the repairs take place? Where's what? Well, where will the repairs take place? They, the bells don't go anywhere. Okay. They go up with a crane, it'll go inside, take the mechanisms out, replace the mechanisms, put the bells attached again. And we tried to get them all done at once this year because we thought once the crane's there, what's the point? Sure. But they really don't need them at this point and as you'll see, we had lots of things to do with the money this year. So. Mary, I have a question. Is it okay now or should I Please. wait? Please. Go ahead. Just what was the work that was done to the bell tower within the past eight or ten years? I don't recall well, the it structural, wasn't to, it? It started, the tower itself started to twist, as I understand it. Carol and the DPW can tell you more about it. But they went in and put a floor of steel to help it from sort of twisting. It, the, just the movement of the bells alone was enough to start to make them worry about cracks in the, in the building. I think Roger Fernandez is here. Yeah. We'll, see, we'll see how we did with that explanation. <laughs> were we good? Did we? Tell us what you did. We were trying to wing it in the past. So, uh, concisely, the bell, the bell tower was experiencing some structural issues in large part because these bells are very heavy. Some of them weigh over a ton, ton and a half. 
and uh, the tower would sway. So we engaged the services of a structural engineer, and essentially we installed a new uh, structural concrete uh, floor slab, if you will, within the building itself that stabilized the building. There were some additional masonry repairs performed on the building, so the good news is hopefully the new bells or the repaired mechanisms, when they do ring them, they're not going to cause the building to sway um, abruptly. So that was what was done. And that was CPC money as well? Uh, that was CPC money, yep. yep. Okay, thanks. You bet. Okay. Now, so at one point in Hingham, there were three forts in town on the highest three hills. And one was up on Old Fort Street, and one was in the Hingham Cemetery. You can still see a stone foundation up in there. And nobody's quite sure where the third one was. But these were a protection for the town from incoming invasions very early on. So the old fort house, after we didn't need the fort any longer, um, was moved about half a block downhill. They must have rolled it on logs and set up as a home and over the years many people lived there um, since it was built in 1685 obviously there were lots of owners over the time but the, f the last owner was our dear friend John Richardson who everybody in town knew was a wonderful historian in town and saved a lot of Hingham artifacts in that structure. When he died um, the building was going on the market and the Hingham Historical Society joined up with the Historic Commission to save the building and you may have all been there, but they put it on a flatbed and they rolled it down North Street and they put it down on a temporary stone foundation uh, on the property of the old ordinary until they had time to figure out where it would go permanently. Well, now it's time. It's been four years sitting there on this sort of wobbly foundation. At the time they moved the fort, they also took the capstones, the giant granite stones that were the top of the foundation and they've saved them. So this money is to put the uh, old fort house back on its original capstones in a permanent location so the town can come through and visit it. It's remarkable inside. It has all its original beams that still have the bark on them. It's just wonderful to see, but they haven't been allowed to let the, the tourists go through because it was not on a, a foundation. So this is really two parts. They will go in first and do a localized um, archaeological dig to make sure they're not plopping it down on top of a grave site or something. And then this will be brought in and put down permanently on its capstone. So I, I hope you can see what the picture is. That's the old ordinary. The picture on the right, that's no, kind of bad on there. But it's the old ordinary is in the front. The big white area is the parking lot. The thing that looks like a checkerboard off to the right is uh, the gardens that the garden club maintains. And in the red circle in the back is where the house is sitting now. It probably will be somewhere close in that area. Again, depending on what the archaeologist digs up when he's in there. And this is 37,300 sponsored by the Hingham Historical Society. Um, we had one absentee, uh, one abstained on this vote because he is the treasurer of the Historical Society. They were the only one that did not vote for it. And my next one is the Harbor Walkway Extension. So you recall a few years ago, uh, the trustees of Bathing Beach put in that wonderful walk, walkway right running across between the parking lot at our harbor and the Bathing Beach. And that's the picture on the right of what that looks like now. This next extension being proposed by the Harbor Development Committee and the Bathing Beach trustees will be to take the next about 360 feet along the harbor till it gets over to the parking lot for the boat launch. And it's just continuation of this dream that they've had since 07 plan to extend a walkway for bikes and walkers and strollers and everything from one end of the harbor to the other end, almost a mile long. And uh, 110,000 uh, will be more than they probably need for this first extension, but as you call this spring, the new bathhouse will be going in uh, closer to 3A along that picture on the left, and so they'll do whatever they can with the money we're giving them, but they'll either have to get a grant to finish it or come back to us in the following year. Any questions? Okay. The uh, Hull Street field play area, as we call it, is um, 
an $85,000 recommendation. Um, it's a projected play area, as it indicates, it's not complicated. Um, it's on the site of what used to be a play area with swings and slides and things, but they deteriorated over the years. There's really nothing left of them now. Uh, you can see from the photo on the left, it's essentially a vacant uh, field now. Um, it's a dense, relatively densely populated area down that end of town, and um, they have no play area in that neighborhood or really anywhere, certainly within walking distance. Uh, or bike, you know, comfortable biking distance without crossing a lot of big streets. Um, we were told it's the recreation department's top priority this year to get that done. Um, they would manage it, maintain it on their own budget. And um, they've assured us that if there are any budget overruns, they would cover that out of their own funds. I just want to thank the Recreation Commission for this. You know, as, as you're driving, towards Hull, you used to go by and see that kind of sad playground equipment. And as you said, um, it's densely populated. There are a lot of families, um, a busy road, and um, it just seems like this is going to get a lot of usage. And um, so really appreciate the Recreation Commission. Um, you know, they've been at different ends of town and finding playgrounds in different neighborhood playgrounds in different places all across Hingham. If anyone's looking to see the land, um, it's right past Glastonbury Abbey on Hull Street. It's on the same side on the left, and all of a sudden you come across this beautiful pasture, and you wonder, well, what's that sitting there for? It's, that's where the playground will go. Carol, just a question on the location. It tends to flood over the years. Is part of the plan to remedy the flooding risk? No, it's actually, if you look at the land carefully, it's in two layers, uh, it, with maybe an 8 okay, or 10 so foot dip. This now, is so on this the bluff. Is the, this is the upper level. Thank you. Closest to the street. They're going to repair the uh, fence that's there so kids that are playing can't dash out into the street. Um, but the lower level is used as fields once in a while when, as you say, it's not underwater. Okay, thanks. Um, this, is for the, this is for the upper level. Carol, just a, a question triggered in my mind with, with this and others. I remember a few years ago that um, down at the harbor with one of the projects, a sign was erected that said, you know, this project is being funded with community preservation. As, as all these projects advance, will that signage be put in place? It's on their contract. They have to yeah, do it. That's great because, yeah. you know, I think, I think sometimes as people see this, it's a really nice connection to see where this money is coming from. and. Mm -hmm. um, not just on this, but on the others. We even give them the signs, don't we, Carol? And there's no excuse for not keeping them up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> okay, the big one. Okay, the big one. Um, I suspect that you all know as much, if not more, than I do about this project, because you've all been thoroughly educated, I'm sure, but so I'll try to go through this uh, pretty efficiently. Um, we on the CPC were not only unanimously in favor of this, but I think there was really no reservations about it and uh, I'll tell you why f briefly because I know you've heard most of this if not all of it. Um, in a summer or two there will be no pool in the town because it's really coming apart and um, it's hanging on by uh, by uh, masking uh, tape, by masking tape and, and uh, should have uh, been replaced long ago. Um, it's I think indisputably would be a major town asset to have this facility in place there. Uh, currently there is no swim team venue to practice or to have meets either for the high school or for the Notre Dame swim team. Um, no indoor pool at all and uh, no pool period uh, except between the 4th of July and uh, Labor Day. So it's really uh, a deficiency that is soon going to become a total deficiency if it's not uh, dealt with. The plan would give us an indoor year-round lap pool, uh, a, warm, a warm pool, uh, both for relaxation and for therapy, um, an outdoor family pool, looks great for my grandchildren and I'm sure others' children, um, to splash around in, um, and um, an indoor exercise and multi-use area for exercise machines, lockers, showers, and the, re and the rest. Um, and uh, I'm sure it would do nothing but good for real estate values in the town. I can see realtors bringing people over there and showing them that facility. Uh, the costs, uh, summarized briefly, 
Um, we allocated or recommended $300,000 for this project, which is somewhat under half of the estimated construction document costs of $650,000. Um, the, um, the reason why there was, there was uh, I think, very solid support for that from a financial point of view is, is largely that uh, there will be no slippery slope here because that money will not get spent uh, unless uh, several contingencies are met. One is that the supporters of the South Shore Country Club will raise independently the remaining $350,000. If they don't raise the money, um, the allocated funds go back to the CPC. Um, the second point, um, they would then uh, develop a long-range plan, a capital uh, financing plan, uh, before any construction goes forward and present that to you and work that through and get you all comfortable with that before any of that money gets spent. And if that doesn't happen and um, uh, there's not a sufficient comfort level with that plan, then too that money goes back to the CPC and uh, does not get spent. And the third element is uh, an operating cost plan that would reasonably project the revenue to cover the operating costs. Um, the uh, belief at this point with the help of an outside consulting firm is that revenues would be likely to be generated to cover those operating costs uh, from user fees, from rentals of birthday parties and things, from therapy use of the warm pool um, and other sources. So um, to sum that all up, um, we think it's undeniably a terrific asset for the town if it came into being. We don't see it as a risk at this point. It's, it's essentially a financial placeholder until uh, they make a case that convinces us all that the project is viable financially. And um, we gave them the full amount they asked for. And I would say as well that we really didn't, I think, shortchange any of the other applicants to get there. Uh, we had a, a, a challenging list of requests that was substantially in excess of the available money. But the weaker projects, if you will, kind of dropped along the wayside before they got to the final stage. And at the final stage, nobody got shut out. Um, most of the requests were fully funded. The ones that, won't, that weren't, I think, were adequately funded to do what they immediately need to do this year. So we don't see this as a, uh, an irresponsible thing at all, and uh, that's why we recommend it. Karen? Yeah, I, you know, um, to your point, Jim, um, Bill Friend and Jay have come before us a number of times and sort of kept us up to speed, and I appreciate that because this is a, this is not only a significant allocation of CPC funds, but it would be a significant project for the town to undertake. So. Having kept us apprised, I think right along has been um, has been helpful and helpful to our decision tonight. I guess um, my question is, um, with respect to the three conditions um, prior to the expenditure of the funds, the the vote language doesn't necessarily designate that. Um, I don't know whether the advisory committee comment would include those conditions, but is there something in your kind of contractual relationship with um, the South Shore Country Club that would limit that expenditure? Yeah, the, the, well, Carol, you can speak to it directly if you like, or you can. Uh, we can share. As we know, after town meeting, um, if this is approved, um, CPC puts together grant agreements and each project has their own specific contract. And in that contract, we will have that language um, put in. Yeah. Um, yeah, just a, a couple things. It's, it's interesting, of, of all the different projects and things on the warrant, this is the one that, um, you know, people are talking about, people are asking about. And so I think this is a great opportunity as well just to confirm a couple of things that maybe we've known, but as people are starting to get interested. Um, one question I had is, if these construction documents are prepared, what, what's their shelf life? And I, I don't know who's best able to answer that. I don't know if it's Jay or Roger, but Jake, okay. And if you wouldn't mind coming to the microphone. So 
the shelf life, uh, I don't anticipate that the drawings themselves would have an extensive, uh, short, short shelf life. But as part of the project, you do, there will be a requirement to undertake some certain permits, local permitting certainly. Those permits do have a shelf life. Uh, but uh, certainly if the project were designed, uh, we don't anticipate that, you know, a year, two years, three years down the road that the drawings would no longer be uh, valid. Or, and the only thing that would change that is if there was a change in the building code or requirement associated with that change in the building code that might necessitate a change in the design. Okay. Thank you, Roger. You're and welcome. Jay, maybe you could just come up because, again, I, I think it's really important that members of the public understand these conditions. So, so the construction document cost is six fifty. CPC is is going to be paying for three hundred of it, but that would not be spent until the remaining three fifty is is already raised yep so the game plan we have the friends of the south shore country club the 501c3 that we started in the last six months here the plan for them is to try to raise the money by town meeting um, that's our goal it's a goal obviously um, you know but it's clear we need the the 300,000 won't get us anywhere in the construction document um, you know world as far as funding for what we need so we need to raise the full six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to move forward and will the will the work on the construction documents Will, there, will the financing plan and the operating cost plan be required to even begin the construction document process? Yeah, we, I mean, absolutely. What, the conversation we had with these guys and from our standpoint is there's no point of spending in a dollar of the 300000 until we're all comfortable, everybody in this room, that that operation, operational and financial plan makes sense and we have a clear path of how we'd like to try to fund this. Obviously, the funding will come down to town meeting, but, um, you know, our plan would be that everyone in this room is comfortable with at least what that strategy is. Well, and, and the revenue projections, you know, sort of influence the design and vice versa, yeah. right? You've got to have some revenue drivers in there to be able to support the operation. And, so. and that's why it's changed quite a bit yeah, over the last few months. You. Yeah, yeah is, is, uh, When we looked at just a six-lane lap pool with the outdoor family pool, Financially speaking, it just was it was generated at a loss when we added the addition of the warm pool the therapy component Along with the fitness facility it allowed us to raise our membership fee and also look at additional revenue from therapy that brought it to a really good uh, Financial plan. I mean still we're at a point right now where we're tweaking stuff We're working through uh, potential opportunities with some different groups that would lease or license space from us That would help us with a lot of that revenue um, and it would also tie it up and be more sustainable. So if we had issues with economic downturn and things like that, we yeah, have yeah, existing yeah. contracts in play that won't change, you know, um, that tie to some serious revenue as part of the plan. So we're still working through a lot of this. The final feasibility study, although we're, you know, 75% complete, there's still another piece to it that we need to uh, finalize, and that should be done by the beginning of April. Hopefully, like, April 1st would be our plan. And I just reiterate that the, the plan here is that this is self-supporting. Um, I've had questions from people who have expressed concern that this project might compete for capital dollars for fire stations or a school, and that's not the case. Yeah, and, and I mean, I, right now, we're working on trying to get the financial plan to be operational, um, you know, in the black. Uh, obviously, there's a large capital ask or you know, component to it, and that's part of the conversation we'll have to have with you guys about how we're going to move forward with that. You know, definitely there's the club has the availability to take debt on um, through this project. There's definitely a large fundraising component to it, but it may not cover all the capital needs, and we'll have to have some sort of conversation about what we should do with the remaining uh, portion yeah. of the capital costs. But just to then to, to bring it back to the original point, which is that the construction documents and that work will not begin until there is a financing plan, and that financing plan we're going to have public discussion about it so that interested people can come and participate. Not a dollar of that will be spent until we're all on board with what that financial plan is. Yeah. Um, thank you. I just think that that's helpful clarity for people who are hearing about this for the first time. And on a more mundane note, what's the, um, what's the food service component going to look like? So uh, Raphael's has the exclusive food and beverage for the whole property. So as long as they're still our food and beverage provider, it will be solely through them. Uh, it'll probably be some sort of 
more glorified snack shack type of thing. But one thing that we've looked at with the multi-purpose room is being able to utilize that room in the evening for like group uh, corporate meetings and things like that. Um, we've had a lot of success with that in our function halls and sometimes the size doesn't fit with what we currently have. So that's something that we'd be able to do uh, over there as well to add to the food and beverage component of it. Lucy, I don't know if members of the advisory committee have questions on this project. Anyone else from advisory? Well, Jay is. Sure Raise your hand I'm if sure you do. Sure, there's lots of questions. I know that uh, I may not have all of them tonight, but I'm certainly working to try to get through them. Paul? Nicole? Nicole, could I just trouble you to come up to the microphone um, because that way people at home can hear your question. And identify yourself, please. Sure. I'm Nicole Rafelson. I'm on the advisory committee. Um, I'm asking this question or sort of reiterating some of the points that have been made just because as a municipal analyst, back in the dark ages of my career, I looked at a lot of feasibility studies and, um, you know, they were for large projects. This is a small project, but typically in a feasibility study, you see stress testing on revenue projections. and. Um, I guess my one concern as, you know, not as a citizen, as a citizen, I love the idea of a pool, but I guess as a um, finance person, my one concern is that, you know, health club revenues are economically sensitive, and if we get into, not if, when, recessions are just normal things that happen, um, are the revenues going to be, you know, so tightly balanced <coughs> there that there could be an event where you're coming to the town looking for the for money at the same time that the town's revenues are being stressed by an economic downturn and you know we have a deficit at the pool and we have you know all sorts of potential like tight budget things that we're dealing with on the on the other side so I guess I would want to see a fairly um, robust feasibility study talking about the revenues and what the assumptions are that are going into memberships and things like that and um, and, and I guess the as an ad advisory committee person the first time through this I would want to see a copy of the CPC contract that says um, those three conditions and really the fourth condition being that the capital financing plan will be in place before any of the 300,000 is spent from the CPC because that's a, a lot of money to put towards something if it's not definitely going to go forward and I would hate to think if any of it was spent and it didn't go forward what kind of feedback we would be getting about that. So th that's a long comment but those are my thoughts. Thank you. Okay. And, and so one part of um, looking at what you just mentioned is that when they decide, when they built the projections as far as membership, he looked at like the capture rate, you know, of the area, and he went at what I, what it seemed like when we were talking, a fairly low percentage. It was like a three to five percent capture rate of the area, and that's based off demographics, you know, age, uh, you know, what the population is in the proximity around the club. And uh, the consultant that I was working with um, thinks that the three to five percent is a really low target to look at. So there's a lot of room to grow there. And then also, when we looked at building the financial plan, you know, for the first three or four years, our utilization we we're looking at only like 60 percent utilization as we watch the business grow. And those are the years where we generate obviously the least in the financial plan we have right now, the least uh, revenue. You know. So if economic downturn happened, I would like to at least think that in a business like we're in right now where the price point's a little bit lower than it is with a higher end private club, you know, similar to our golf business where we're more of like the $50 round of golf instead of the $150 round of golf, becomes a little bit less sensitive um, to economic downturn. But, you know, hopefully our utilization rates where we're estimated to be on the low end to begin with would just stay on the low end and that would be the worst case scenario uh, type of thing. Um, and then as far as the fourth point that you brought up, um, I, I think the, com the, the plan that we have right now and is that we, you know, to be able to move forward with the construction documents we, allows us to be able to buy time with the failing pool. You know, like if, if we're able to come up with a financial plan that the selectmen are comfortable with, that advisory thinks makes sense, um, the last component of that would be the town voting on it and approving it. Um, our plan would be to hopefully have the construction documents done by that point in time in a year from now, basically, 
so that when the town approves it and it'd be the last piece to that puzzle, um, we're ready to break ground and start building a new pool. Um, you know, and that the reason why we've set that timeline is because of the failing facility we have. Um, and, and there's a concern that if we did a, a design, you know, a design and build project together, and we don't start that process until the town approves it uh, in a year from now or a year plus from now, um, that we could potentially be, you know, two years away from breaking ground at that point, or another year, two years from today, or two years from April away from breaking ground. So that's kind of why we structured the timeline the way we did, so that we'd be able to, rather than have a uh, design build project, design, get town meetings approved, <coughs> and then start building um, to help us in that timeline. So it's a different approach, and I worked with Roger to kind of come up with that idea. Um, but it's what I think makes sense based on the failing structure that we currently have. But, and then also to speak to the large, the concern, you know, of the whole thing, like, you know, it's, the financial plan has to make sense enough that, you know, we don't set ourselves up for failure in our enterprise fund, is we've solicited, um, I was fortunate enough to find out and get in contact with the people that did the feasibility study for the Wellesley pool that they they're just broke ground on. And, uh, you know, it's a much larger project. It's like a $20 million project. And, Scope-wise, it's different, but I, I got in touch with the financial uh, group that did the feasibility study for them, and I contracted them to do peer review on our financials. So I think you know there, there's a very small group of people in in the U.S. that do this um, recreational financial analysis, and I have two of the the, the most well-known groups looking at the same project um, and coming up with. I don't know yet what the peer review numbers will be and what he'll have to say, but uh, by the end of the day, we'll have two groups that analyzed it independently and came up with hopefully some. And um, my, you know, my only comment to municipal analysts is that people who do feasibility studies are in the business of making projects work and happen. Yeah. You know, so just to always bring that skepticism to it. Um, and then I was curious to Revenue, yeah. So that's an opportunity, like if you go to the Weymouth Club right now, um, where you look at there's large, like something like this, like digital screens where you have looped advertising going on. Uh, there's an opportunity um, to, to sell advertising to, you know, facilities like some of the local high schools, the private high schools in the area, private elementary schools in the area that are trying to target groups like us. Uh, so when I looked at, you know, it's definitely something that we're interested in. Um, it's an opportunity there, similar to like when you go to an ice rink, you know, and you see advertising around the ice rink. And, but it's hard to know, you know, what the percent, how much money you're going to make doing that. Um, it all kind of depends on how hard and how aggressively you work trying to, buy, you know, sell that advertising. So I looked at what the, I spoke with the, um, the general manager at the Weymouth Club and looked at what they do in annual advertising and the different campaigns that they offer. And then also looked at that Wellesley um, feasibility study that they put together and came up with a 5% uh, of gross revenue is what they'd estimate as a, um, you know, uh, a, a campaign that makes sense in a facility about the size that we have. And that's what I, uh, when I put together the Excel spreadsheet, that's what I based it off is that 5% gross revenue number. Um, you know, I have uh, groups, uh, members of, of my group that I'm working with on this that think that they could blow that number out of the water and, and you know, get Herb Chambers and Ernie Bach Jr. up there, you know, spending, you know, thousands of dollars to advertise in our facility. But I tried to push that back a little bit and say, let's just go with at least what they said in the Wellesley study, the 5%, and that's the number that I used. So, yeah. We, we will have a chance to ask more questions when the community preservation folks come to visit ADCOM in a couple of weeks. So if there's nothing else that's urgent, I know the time is passing and you have other things thank on your you. agenda. Um, Jay, thank you very much. I, I just had one, I guess, one other thought as we, as we kind of move forward and we think about the, condi you know, the conditions and, and uh, sort of check back in with the Board of Selectmen or the Advisory Committee or both. You know, the quick notes I took um, I think you mentioned that the long-range capital planning would be potentially subject to consultation with the board or approval by the board. Um, you know, the, 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 the revenue piece to me is very important as well. And so I just, as we roll forward, I, I wonder if there's a role for the board to play in terms of, you know, added skepticism um, of, of that analysis. So, uh, you know, as it rolls forward, we may want to think about how we structure 
I guess, review of the conditions as we move forward to, to determine whether the plan makes sense. I look forward to, to that. You know, that, that's the guidance that I'm looking for. Okay. And I, I think that we should, before we get, um, you know, too deep into that, I'd like to get you the peer review analysis too. Yep. Uh, so you have both independent, um, you know, things to look at. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Okay. That Thank actually worked cool at the end. Yeah, I, that was a uh, good, good sequencing. Yeah. Um, Carol or Jim, anything else for, for us for this evening? No, are you voting tonight? Or so, you, you know, we, we typically on, on something like this again, and this is, I know you've had your hearings televised, which I think is very helpful for giving all these great projects visibility, but I think it's this board's practice that when we have, you know, some of these policy decisions, we'll defer the vote for a week because that gives the opportunity for the public to ask questions, give input. Um, and so uh, next week I would envision taking this up. I don't, you know, I, I don't envision um, our having a lot of conversation, but if there is anyone in the public with a question or wishes to express themselves. So uh, I, I think we would probably, Tom, vote this, yep. vote this article next week. Um, I, I just want to thank you for all your great work. I mean, you're, it's a, um, you know, I, I know it looks all nice and neat, all, that's all clipped together <laughs> with the colored pictures, but I know there's been a lot of input, a lot of diligence, a lot of other projects that you've had to make some difficult decisions on. And, um, you know, as Mary said at the outset, and a, a couple of the projects that we got to talk about because the Board of Selectmen were involved in them earlier on, you know, s s certain of these projects really stand out and make Hingham what it is. Um, and so I, I just, on behalf of the town, I, I appreciate all of your hard work, really do. You have a wonderful committee. Good I just wanted to add, too, that uh, by saying we wanted to make sure that you were comfortable with this pool project, I meant the plural you. The, yeah. as, I, as a former advisory committee chairman, I have to make that clear as well, not just the selectmen, but the well, advisory. Well, you know, in, in this process, as, as we know, in many cases, advisory is a proxy for town meeting, and these are a lot of questions that might come up on the floor of town meetings. So having the ability to answer, contemplate them, be able to you know, talk through them, I just think makes, makes the process easier, particularly with this pool. This, is, this would be a big, a big discussion deal. to have yeah. on the floor of town meeting. And uh, so it's, it's to everyone's benefit. And we, um, we also appreciate the advisory committee joining us with thoughtful questions and comments. And um, we will, uh, I think you're going to go back to your meeting room. We're going to get together again a week from today for, um, for the school budget. Our board still has a couple of items of business. So um, we would just thank everybody for this portion of the evening. Good to see you all. Um, Tom, as, as people are just moving out, do we want to just do Article C real quick? Sure. So Article C is a perennial article that covers the reports of the various town committees. Um, we have some language here that I could propose to the board to consider. Do you want me to read it? Sure. So the, re the article would be titled Reports of Various Town Committees. Be Article C, to hear the reports of the following. Affordable Housing Trust, Audit Committee, Capital Outlay Committee, Commission on Disability Issues, Community Preservation Committee, Conservation Commission, Country Club Management Committee, Council on Aging, Energy Action Committee, Fire Station Building Committee, GAR Hall Trustees, Harbor Development Committee, Hingham Historic Districts Commission, The Historian, Historical Commission, Board of Managers of Lincoln Apartments, LLC, Long Range Waste Disposal and Recycling Committee, the Memorial Bell Tower Committee, Open Space Acquisition Committee, the Scholarship Fund Committee, the 2006 School Building Committee, Wastewater Master Planning Committee, and the Water Supply Committee or to act on anything relating thereto. These are the committees that are formed by town meeting, which is why they're specifically called out. As you know, in the annual report, we tend to have uh, reports from all committees as well as town departments. So, um, And I would just note that the recommended motion includes the discharge of the 2006 School Building Committee, which after consultation with the school committee and that building committee, um, they, they said that their work was completed. So yeah. uh, that, would, uh, that would be part of the recommended motion. I was going to say, does that, that has to be voted by town meeting, right? 
because it was created by dissolution by, of that committee. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yep. Exactly. So there are no other bodies that because we've discharged a bunch of committees, but there are no other committees. Then that's always like the the checking, the typo yep. kind of checking. Okay. I think we're good with that. Any questions? Okay. So uh, should we vote? Sure. Vote that. Um, I move to recommend uh, favorable action on Article C as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I Aye. didn't forget that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now I didn't doubt you. What's that? I didn't doubt you. So uh, the last item on our agenda, and I'm going to turn it over to Karen, is an update uh, with respect to the Hingham Housing Authority and a discussion about 100 Beale Street. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so shortly after um, uh, I took office in May, um, uh, Tom Mayo, Ted Alexiadis, and I met with Daveline Cooper, who was then the chair of the um, Hingham Housing Authority to talk about the transfer of about eight acres of land um, at on Beale Street. So to to sort of back up about I don't know 17 or 18 years ago, there were a bunch of bunkers. You, some people in the town right mem might remember in the land that was around Bear Cove Park in this Beale Street vicinity, and um, those bunker buildings had asbestos. Um, they were a nuisance. You know, people were lighting fires in there, and um, the town determined that for safety reasons, um, those structures ought to come down. So in the process of doing the diligence in removing those structures, um, it, the town um, realized that a couple of the structures were actually on land, about 18 acres of land, owned by the housing authority. So the town uh, was then Charlie Cristello, who was our town administrator, approached the uh, housing authority um, and, and suggested that those buildings need to come down and that the town could do it, um, but the housing authority didn't have cash to pay for that. Um, and so the housing authority said, hey, well, we'll give you some of this land that we own on Beale Street because we don't have any need for it. And a certain part of that acreage in any event is wetlands. So I guess it was about 2001, the town actually entered into a contract with the housing authority to do just that we'll take down these couple of buildings that, you know, should come down, and you'll transfer to the town um, about eight acres of land. So in the midst of changes in town administrators and boards of selectmen, um, with all good intentions on everybody's part, um, the final I didn't get dotted and the final T didn't get tr crossed, and so the deed that would actually hand the land back to the town was never executed. So fast forward to 2017, um, 2016, 2017, um, in the midst of doing some diligence around um, the parcels owned by the selectmen on Beale Street, I think it was part of the board's earlier discussions of the development of the Beale Street property prior to the Alliance project coming online. Um, uh, through town council, uh, Susan Murphy, we did some diligence on, you know, what do we own, where are the property lines, what are the conditions, you know, the kind of stuff you'd go through if you're going to undertake development of your property. So in doing that, um, it came to the town's attention that indeed this eight acres um, that, that uh, we were supposed to get as consideration for taking down those two old buildings never came to the town. And so this past summer, as I said at the beginning, I talked to Davaline Cooper, made her aware um, of this um, omission, and talked with her about making sure that we finalize this transaction. You know, the buildings have come down <laughs> about 18 years ago, and so now let's just finalize things. So um, we engaged in some conversations over the summer and into the fall. Um, Davaline talked with her, her board. Um, Susan Murphy and I went to a Housing Authority board meeting to explain what we had found, to present the board again with the contract that had been signed with the town to convey the land, um, and the, and the uh, Housing Authority board requested some additional diligence materials, which were in line with exactly what I would ask for if I were being asked to consummate this transaction, you know, contracts and um, actually evidence that the buildings came down, a copy of the contract so that you can, as a fiduciary for the Housing Authority, check that off your list. Uh, we provided all of that stuff to Davaline Cooper, again, as the then chair of the Housing Authority, um, 
uh, she found it all in order. The pro bono attorney, I understand, that works, works with the Housing Authority on other housing matters, found it all in order. And so the Housing Authority was scheduled to take a vote to transfer the property and, and to execute the deed uh, in favor of the town for this eight acres. Um, the Housing Authority instead um, took a vote not to transfer this land back to the town, I guess, at this time. And that was a three to one vote uh, by the Housing Authority. So it puts us in a little bit of a dilemma. Um, I think we have, um, we have patiently sort of worked through an issue that we discovered um, with the Housing Authority, um, trying to correct something that should have been corrected years ago. I, I don't dispute that. Um, and we sort of patiently worked through our, our process. I, I worked through it on behalf of the board as your liaison. My role tonight was to report out um, how I did with that project, which wasn't too well, I guess. Um, uh, but to tell you that we're now in a situation where the Housing Authority has a parcel of land that really belongs to the town. So I think we're in a position, I guess, you know, from my personal standpoint, we're in a position where we need to um, decide w what steps we would take to move forward to get back an asset that belongs to the town. The thing that's a little, the thing that makes it a little uncomfortable is that, you know, the Housing Authority is part of us. Even though it's a, a, a state agency with its own elected board, it's in Hingham. The people who live there are in Hingham. You know, the volunteers are Hingham residents. So it's, this discussion tonight's a little uncomfortable. That notwithstanding, that you, that notwithstanding, this is a promise that the Housing Authority Board made to the town. The town undertook work on the basis of that promise, and what we're asking the Housing Authority to do is fulfill its promise. So I think that, um, I guess there's a couple, couple approaches we could take to this. We could sort of set a timeline to say, now that you sort of fully understand um, the scope of this issue, um, and the response that the town actually needs to take um, to get the land back, you know, would the Housing Authority consider or reconsider its vote and actually effectuate the deed as it promised to do in its contract? Or, you know, and I, I hate to say this, or the other alternative is that the town would be in a position where it would have to sue its own Housing Authority. It would have to seek a declaratory judgment for specific performance in Superior Court am I in the, or Land Court. So um, unfortunately, that's where we're, where we're at with this. And I don't, I don't know if I've done it justice or if you have additional questions, but that's my report. Who was on the Housing Authority when they entered into this agreement with the town? Um, I have it in my file. I can, I can tell you. Bucky, Jackie, Karen. Myself. Yeah, I can't read it. And Griffin, right? And Griffin. Microphone. You, you got to hit the mic, Jim. Oops. You got to hit the mic. Jim, if you wouldn't mind so that the uh, viewing audience. Of course, I, I should know better. No, you asked who was on the authority at the time. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Jane Davis, who was the chair at the time, John Cafferty, who was the state appointee, and Griffin, who I think was a tenant. Myself, and right now I don't remember who else. I'm, I'm going by the people Bob, that signed the agreement. Bob Keys. Yeah, and Bob Keys. I thought I said that right. So the remaining ones are Bob Keys and myself, are the people who've been on all along. And who's on the housing authority presently? Right now, we're down to three people because of Davlin's resignation, and because of the tenant vacancy. So it's myself, Bob, and Irma Lauter, who's, who's this, who's the state appointee. Just three people, and see, under the, if I can just expand on this, under the uh, open meeting law, we can't talk to each other at all. We feel your pain. What? We feel your pain. Yeah. Excuse me, yes. Yeah. When, and so did, that, when did Davaline Cooper resign? About a week ago, after the, after the meeting that went badly. And, and I, well, I think she had, well, there's a lot of issues. She had, you know, she had various reasons, but very well thought out, but it's been about a week. Any other, any other questions? 
so. I just want to make sure I understand the lay of the land. No. Um, thank you. You've you've invested a lot of time in this um, as his attorney Murphy, and you know appreciate it. And um, I share with you that we're sort of in an uncomfortable spot. And um, I guess my point of view, and you, you know, you mentioned that. You know, in in these different situations, we all have fiduciary responsibilities, and it's often difficult when you have boards that turn over and things are uncovered. And right. you know, we were we were not on the original board that that enacted a transaction, but that's really where I think we have to rely on, you know, the documentation and and town meeting votes. And I, I guess I look at it and say that we have a fiduciary responsibility to the town. Uh, which is, you know, I, I, I know we all take that seriously, and I know the Housing Authority takes it seriously. Um, you know, what, what I might propose to my colleagues is that um, this, this has been helpful while Thomas kept us surprised. It's helpful to hear this. I think it's been our board's practice that we typically don't, you know, when we get a report out on something, we typically don't necessarily vote on something the night of a meeting. Um, I know I'd sort of like to reflect on this, and I would maybe suggest that that would provide, you know, I would propose a two-week window at which um, it would also provide the Housing Authority with an opportunity to reconsider its vote if it chose to. Um, so I, I might suggest that we put this on our agenda for two weeks from now, which is February 13th, if, if that's agreeable to my colleagues. And I, I can provide you with, you know, if you want the diligence package that we put together for the Housing Authority, I can pro provide you with that so you can sort of step through and see exactly the decision timeline and, and to your point, Mary, the property rights of the town that we really have no, we really have no we have no alternative here. We need to perfect the property rights of the town. May I make a comment, Madam Chair? Jim, sure. Yeah. You, 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 you just said what I was going to ask for. You know, because of the open meeting law, we, we, we can't talk to each other. And uh, what I was going to request was a deferral of, of any action to give us a chance to have a couple, at least one special meeting where the three of us can talk. I can't guarantee any result from it. Sure. I, but I appreciate that. We have that. to do that. And what my purpose of that would be to review, you know, all the issues around the site, the current issues, and to identify the, the actions that we need to take to bring about the conveyance. Many of us thought wrongly that that had been done and that it just hadn't been recorded for some reason. And that was sort of, sort of like a little folklore within the authority that, oh yeah, nobody recorded it. Well, we, we didn't take the steps needed. And I talked to Sharon, our director today, and she was saying, right, we don't necessarily have the capacity to draft the deed and do the things that are needed. But in 2001, we agreed to do these things. And it's binding. It's still binding. And uh, so anyway, yeah. I, I would appreciate well, it very it much. Sounds, yeah. It sounds like if what, what we're proposing would, would, would be, you know, that that would, that would work as well. And I appreciate your coming tonight. Oh, yeah. Um, and, 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 and let me just offer that, you know, the night we met with you all in December, when Susan Murphy and I were with you, we indicated that um, Ms. Murphy would draft a deed uh, that the Housing Authority Board could execute. In addition, Ms. Murphy has drafted the necessary vote that the Board uh, would need to take to effectuate, effectuate the transfer. So we, we get that you don't have t potentially the legal bandwidth, and we are, you know, we, we offered it. Uh, we have those materials. I can make that available to you tomorrow. Um, I also want to say, Jim, that um, you've been very diligent and very thoughtful since we've, I, I think, been able to talk further about just what this means. And, um, and you know, I, I guess I think it's important. I, I know there's like a lot of noise around some of some of this transaction. You know, there's been a lot of noise about development on Beale Street. I really think in this case, and I said this to you when we chatted on the phone a couple times um, late last week, this is a very narrow legal issue. Um, and that I, I really think you've got to put the noise aside and you've got you've to look at what the legal obligation is of the housing authority to the town of Hingham. And we can deal with some of this other stuff later um, and, and continue to have conversations about the concerns that have arisen around the parcel itself. But the legal obligation is the key to this particular transfer. I'm afraid I don't 
get everything that you're saying. I mean, I'm not just hearing it that clearly, but <coughs> just for myself as, I guess, uh, acting chair by default or something, that I t totally respect that I was here. I was with the meeting with Charlie Crisello. We totally agreed to it. And, we, and then we went sort of into a passive mode and, and did nothing. Right, right. And I was talking to Sharon tonight, our, our, our director. She was saying we don't really have the staff capacity to, to know and, and bring about all the steps. And I'm saying, okay, fine. Let's have a couple of special meetings, identify what is needed. And, and I think you were saying that perhaps you, you have the resources. We, we can get to that to you tomorrow. We, we can get that to you tomorrow, Jim. Hmm? We can get you the, the things that you need to get this done. We can give you tomorrow. Good with them very quickly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and that's good because that, that, that makes me feel takes, good. Takes away one impediment, right? Yeah. I'm sorry. Again, I can't hear it. I think I got an echo. It's hard. It's echoing in here when especially. We'll get you what. Yeah, we'll get you what you need. We'll get you what you need. We're taking your chances. I can't guarantee the two people's votes. And, you know, any issue has lots of issues. Yep, sure. But, but if we call a special meeting and if we all get there, you know, I'll ask for a motion to take any whatever steps are required yeah. to implement what we agreed to. Eight, 16 years ago. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's a lot Thank of time you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank thank All right. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You, Jim. I appreciate I it. Ask us a little more time. This is great. Good. Yep. Yeah, yep. I appreciate but it. I am, I am going to put this on for two weeks. Um, yep. so, so, so February 13th. I mean, as you know, and, and you're, you're good at always coming to our meetings and sitting through, but um, uh, particularly this time of year with warrant articles and other things like that, we we have a number of things the board wants to take up. So it would be my intent to take this up on the 13th. That's not very good. And, and that's it's two weeks. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Thank thanks, you. thanks, Jim. I, Paul, did you have something to add? Yeah, Jim, if if I may. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. Jim, I've known you a very long time. I believe you to be an honorable man. I respect your strength of character coming in tonight for this very difficult conversation. I, see, I think that sets you in a special place. Um, I urge you to prevail. <laughs> I, I, I urge you to prevail upon your colleagues to recognize the difficult conversation that you've just had with yeah, us, sure. and and take the necessary steps to correct yeah. what we will just call a, a hiccup, so that we can go forward and continue to work together collegially. You know, the best we can do is get this. Leave us together. Sure. And explore this. And thank right. You for the nice yeah. Oh. My pleasure, sir. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Okay. Oh, He's not leave, leaving out time. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go to the academy. Yep. Can't Jim, watch the cord, okay? Yeah, don't trip. Yeah. Um, right. Thank you. Okay. And I, I would suggest, Karen, if you've got that, if you've got that information, to maybe give it to Tom to, to circulate. We'll that would it. be uh, that would yep. be helpful. I think actually, I'm just double checking. I think we've concluded the agenda yeah. for this evening. So yeah. we will next meet a week from tonight, and uh, a portion of our meeting will be uh, business with, with the board. We will, in this room, have the joint school budget hearing with the school committee, the advisory committee, and our board. And um, so we uh, uh, thank everybody for joining tonight. I would uh, accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Oh, what's the date again? The date of that meeting? Jim, our next meeting is on uh, next Tuesday, February 6th. Yeah, but and the 13th. 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 February 13th. Okay. Take a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.